It's Saturday night, and a teenaged boy and girl are out on a date. They are strolling through a shopping mall, with plans to see a movie later at the theater attached to the mall. As they walk through the mall waiting for their show to start, the girl spots something. It's a photo booth. She excitedly grabs the boy's hand and pulls him inside. They close the curtain, insert a coin, and the machine comes to life, snapping a series of photos. The two exit the booth, but both seem to be a little… off. It's getting close to showtime, though, so they start making their way to the movie theater. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the mall patrons, something is happening deep below the ground. The boy and girl exit the theater and walk arm in arm through the alley back toward the parking lot where the boy left his car. It's late now, the sun has long since set, and they're all alone. But they don't hear the footsteps behind them, or sense the pair of bodies that are following them, getting closer and closer. They get to the car, it's the only one left in the parking lot, and the boy takes out his keys to unlock the car when he fumbles and drops them to the ground. As he bends over to pick them up, he finally sees who has been following them. It's them, a pair of doppelgangers coming straight towards them. They look exactly like the boy and girl, except for their faces, which are horribly distorted, with strange lumps and no eyes or mouths. They look as though they were a drawing of a face that was somehow smudged out. The boy quickly gets the keys and grabs the girl, dragging her away from the creatures, who are now reaching for the boy and girl, grasping and clawing at their faces as they try to moan through their skin-covered mouths. He gets the car unlocked, and both manage to get inside. As the creatures bang on the windows, the boy starts the engine and drives away, leaving the abominations behind. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-715, also known as my face that I may be. SCP-715 is a take-your-own-photo brand photo booth, a product of the Sony Corporation made in the 1970s. This is a standard-looking photo booth, bearing a close resemblance to the many thousands of others that were in operation around the world at the time, with no anomalous visual characteristics at all. The only detail setting this machine apart from its countless brethren is a small metal tag which has been added to the back of the machine at some point but a significant amount of wear has made it impossible to read what, if anything, was ever stamped on the tag. SCP-715's basic operation is also not anomalous in appearance. It will only activate if an individual sits inside and inserts the required coinage, at which point it will take a series of photos, just like a normal photo booth. The photos will also appear normal, though often some will be heavily distorted and obscure the subject's face in various ways. What truly sets this photo booth apart, however, is what happens outside of the booth when the pictures are taken. While the individuals who had their photos taken, classified as SCP-715-B instances, are able to exit the booth with no obvious effects, below them all, deep underground, something truly terrifying takes place. Underneath the mall is Site-81715 an extra-dimensional space which is accessible through a mall maintenance service door located in sub-basement 3, a door that does not appear on any of the mall's structural blueprints or in other records. The site consists of a giant cavernous room, which appears to have been hewn right out of the surrounding limestone. In the middle of the room is its most distinguishing feature, a large, deep pit. The walls of the pit are made of an unidentified substance, though it appears similar in both appearance and composition to human fat tissue. These fleshy walls secrete a powerful, corrosive substance, which makes examination and exploration of the pit particularly dangerous. When SCP-715 is activated in the mall above, a humanoid creature, classified as SCP-715-A, will appear in this pit. The bodies of these creatures are similar in appearance to the individuals who had their picture taken inside of 715, but their faces are radically different. Each has severe facial disfigurements and abnormalities, such as large growths, deep lacerations, and the absence of facial features. After appearing in the pit, these SCP-715-A instances will attempt to scale the fleshy walls of the pit and leave Site-81-715. These instances are considered hostile, 
and Foundation security personnel are authorized to neutralize the creatures by any means necessary. Further research into how the SCP-715-A entities are formed and what exactly the pit is are ongoing, and it's not currently known how many 715-A instances exist down in the pit. With the entities who were able to climb out of the pit able to be relatively easily neutralized by security forces, SCP-715 was originally classified as safe. It was contained at its point of origin within the mall in Ohio, and Foundation personnel posing as mall employees would collect the photos printed by the machine. However, following additional discoveries, this classification necessitated changing. The Foundation began noticing inconsistencies with SCP-715-B entities after a researcher tested SCP-715 himself by sitting inside and having his photo taken. Soon after, he began acting in ways that were considered strange, such as when he turned down a promotion to a prominent position with better pay and perks for seemingly no reason, and when he skipped a mandatory site inspection for reality-bending anomalies. After noticing these strange behaviors, a Foundation research head had an anomalous optical enhancement device placed in the oddly acting researcher's bedroom and learned a surprising truth about the SCP-715-A and B entities. The Foundation had been killing the wrong ones. The device, which could remove anomalous reality-distorting effects from images, showed that the researcher was actually one of the creatures from the pit with the telltale facial distortions. Following this shocking revelation, the research head used the same device on the creatures still inside the pit underneath the mall. They found that when the anomalous visual effects were removed from the distorted creatures who were trying to get out of the fleshy pit, that they were actually normal-looking humans. These SCP-715-A entities were the human beings who had entered the photo booth, had their pictures taken, and were somehow transported to the pit. They had been trying to escape their prison and tell the Foundation who they really were, but this only resulted in them being terminated by the on-site security forces. In order to fix this mistake, SCP-715 was hastily reclassified as Keter, and SCP-715 was removed from the mall in order to be stored in a secure locker at Site-19. Research personnel were no longer able to access SCP-715 without special authorization, and study of the interior was limited to what could be done via remote drone use only. The Foundation began rounding up all known instances of SCP-715-B, who were now the ones subjected to immediate termination. Foundation staff did manage to interview one 715-B instance, though, who had been previously believed to be a fellow Foundation researcher. It is unknown exactly what the researcher Doppelganger said in that interview, but it must have been extremely serious, as the end result was another complete change in protocol. All attempts to contain and neutralize instances of SCP-715-B would immediately cease, since if there were as many out in the world as the doppelganger claimed, then ultimately, it would better maintain normalcy and ensure the secrecy of SCP-715 if they were allowed to go free. Sadly, the same was not the case for the SCP-715-A instances that still existed down in the pit. The researcher Doppelganger advised that it would be unwise to remove them from the pit, and the current Foundation policy is that down in the pit is where they will remain. Following this interview, SCP-715 was reclassified once again as safe. The photo booth was also moved again, this time to a maximum security storage locker at Site-81, and Foundation personnel have been prohibited from interacting with SCP-715-B instances at all. However, there is one more piece of information about SCP-715, and it is only accessible to those with proper security clearance. Another Foundation agent was found to actually be an instance of SCP-715-B, and taken into custody for observation. While under surveillance, it was discovered that this instance, classified as SCP-715-B7, was emitting low-level radiation that was somehow directed at Site-81-715 the location of the pit. During an autopsy of the creature, it was found that the radioactive emissions were actually increasing in output and frequency, and soon after, a power outage and containment breach occurred at the site where the autopsy took place. Following these events, the body of SCP-715-B7 disappeared, and video surveillance confirmed that several members of Foundation staff were responsible, all of whom 
had been involved in SCP-715 research. The staff members escaped with the body and left no other evidence behind, save for a single photo with the ominous text, My ears that I may hear, my eyes that I may see, my mouth that I may speak. Do not touch my face. No other information regarding SCP-715 has been found, and many questions remain. Just what are instances of 715B, and what do they want? Are they some kind of hive mind colony that reproduces through the use of a mysterious photo booth? What happens to those left behind in the pit, and what will they do should they ever get out? Investigations are ongoing. A pair of SCP Foundation researchers open the door of a containment cell and find themselves staring at something unlike anything they've ever seen before. Sitting in the middle of the room is a giant lump that appears to be made of what can only be described as flesh. The two look at each other in disbelief. Just what is this thing? They circle the huge blob, looking it over, wondering what on earth it could be. One of the researchers finally gets the courage to actually feel it. He finds that it's warm to the touch. And does he detect some slight movement? He slowly moves to place his ear against it to listen but a sudden shudder from the mask sends him jumping back in fright. Just then, the other researcher calls to him from the other side of the sphere. It sounds like he has found something. As he approaches, he too sees what caused his partner to call out. There, in the middle of this tumorous ball, is a door. It's a circular iron hatch, the kind sealed by a valve, and it's open. Now the researchers are really confused. A massive lump of living flesh is strange enough, but why does it have a door? One of the researchers peeks inside. Is that a couch they see? And a table? Does someone live in this thing? Things are getting beyond strange. The two researchers look up at the observation window where their supervisor is watching them. The supervisor does not hesitate. He nods at them, and the researchers know what they must do. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The researcher who lost winces. He knew that coming to work at the SCP Foundation meant that he would be dealing with some strange, dangerous, and disgusting anomalies, but he never imagined he would have to climb inside a giant orb of meat. His partner opens the hatch all the way and offers a hand to help him. Knowing he has no other option, the researcher steps inside. Inside, the air is hot, thick, and moist like a cramped gym that's had too many bodies exerting themselves on a warm, humid day. He walks through the short entranceway, and his eyes adjust to the dim light to find that he's standing in the middle of a cozy little room. A single, small lamp on a table is giving off just enough light for him to see that the room is sparsely furnished, with a few pieces including a small couch and a twin bed. Outside, his partner calls to him, asking what he can see. As the researcher turns to answer, the door snaps shut. The valve spins on its own, locking itself tight. Try as he might, the researcher can't get it to budge. He bangs on the door and yells, Is he alright in there? Is everything okay? His only response is a muffled scream from inside the ball of flesh. He keeps pulling at the door, twisting the valve with all of his strength, but it won't move. The sounds of gurgles and wet sloshing come from inside the meaty growth. An alarm starts to sound as he strains against the door, exerting himself so hard that he feels like a vein in his head might burst. Suddenly, the valve loosens, and a sudden lack of resistance causes him to fall to the floor. The valve spins on its own, and the door swings open once again. The ball of flesh is quiet once more. The researcher picks himself up off the ground and slowly, carefully, peeks inside. Hello? Are you okay? Is anyone in there? There's no response. That is, until a blast of hot air comes rushing out of the hatch, blowing the researcher's hair back. When it's over, he peeks inside again. His fellow researcher is nowhere to be seen. Inside is the same couch, bed, and table with a small lamp. But there's something new there, too. Across from the couch, where there was nothing before, is a small television. While this may seem strange, it's just another day at the SCP Foundation, where anomalous objects and creatures are studied and contained, including 
SCP-002, also known as the Living Room. SCP-002 is the designation given to a large, tumorous, fleshy growth. It's roughly spherical, with a circumference just over 15 meters, giving it an estimated volume of around 60 meters cubed. Located on one side is an iron valve hatch, similar to what might be found on an old submarine, which leads into the interior of the ball. Those who step inside are surprised to discover a small room that resembles a low-rent studio apartment, complete with furniture and even a small window. Strangely, the outside of the ball of flesh shows no windows and indeed no openings at all, save for the iron hatch. The furniture in the room displays no anomalous properties, though examination has revealed that the furniture appears to be constructed of sculpted bone, woven hair, and other biological substances, all coming from human bodies. Analysis of samples taken from the furniture has shown each to be constructed from independent and fragmented DNA sequences, several of which correspond to SCP research personnel who have been lost inside of SCP-002. To date, the living room has been responsible for seven members of staff going missing. At the same time, during the course of its containment at the SCP Foundation, the room appears to have added multiple additional furnishings, including two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. Tests have been performed using a variety of non-human entities in order to see if they would provoke a similar response from SCP-002 to that of humans. Various lab animals, including those with close DNA to humans such as chimpanzees, have been placed in the room. But so far, all have failed to make the living room react. Human cadavers were also tested, but they too did not produce any effect. It is unknown what causes SCP-002 to engage in its behavior, but whatever process it uses to convert organic matter into furnishings seems to only be triggered by the presence of living human beings. SCP-002 was discovered in northern Portugal following reports of an object falling from Earth's orbit. There in the bottom of a small crater was SCP-002. It was encased in a thick shell of rock but the anomaly's fleshy exterior could be seen through cracks that were likely created by the impact. A local farmer was the first to spot the object falling to Earth and brought word of what he found to his village. At the same time, a Level 4 SCP Foundation agent stationed in the area detected elevated levels of radioactivity and traced the source back to the crater. An SCP collection squad led by General Mulhausen was dispatched to the impact site and quickly secured the area. Test subjects from the nearby village were recruited for initial analysis of the object, with three men being individually sent inside of SCP-002, all of whom disappeared. Having confirmed this anomaly's deadly properties, General Mulhausen then issued a Level 4A termination order that would apply to any local witnesses in order to ensure that no knowledge of the object reached the outside world. He then oversaw its transport to an SCP containment facility. As Foundation staff prepped SCP-002 for relocation, four members of the security personnel were seemingly mesmerized and drawn inside the object where they too disappeared. This was the first hint that SCP-002 possesses some form of subtle mind control with the ability to influence humans into stepping inside of it. It was after these losses that it was first noticed that the object appeared to grow new furnishings following someone disappearing inside. After these mishaps, General Mulhausen ordered all staff to wear hazmat suits when dealing with SCP-002, and following the General's own termination, SCP-002 was placed in containment at the secure facility where it currently resides. Due to the ongoing danger presented by SCP-002, the risk it poses to any who step inside of it, and the mind control abilities it possesses, it has been classified as Euclid. It is to remain connected at all times to a suitable power supply to keep it in a charging mode of some kind, which appears to make it more docile. In the event of a power outage, staff in the immediate area are to be evacuated and the object's containment cell emergency barrier is to be closed, sealing it off from the rest of the site. Once power is re-established, strobing X-ray and ultraviolet lights are to be activated in the containment cell until SCP-002 is returned to its charging mode. Research teams investigating SCP-002 that will come within 20 meters of the object must consist of no fewer than two members. Personnel should also maintain physical contact with one another at all times, 
to confirm that the other is present and not experiencing any feelings of confusion, dulled perception, or other forms of bewilderment that may lead to them entering the living room. No personnel at all below a level 3 clearance are allowed inside of SCP-002, and any staff that have contact with the anomaly are to be escorted no less than 5 kilometers away and must undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. SCP-002 is one of the oldest anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, but remains one of the least understood. Perhaps one day we'll understand what it is and why it was at one time sitting in the orbit of Earth. Did someone send it here, intending us to one day find it? Did it come here of its own volition? Or did we put it there ourselves, in an attempt to keep it away? Tell me if it starts to hurt, the dentist says before reaching into your mouth with a pair of orthodontic pliers and starting to pull your front teeth back into place. Evidently your screams aren't enough of an indication of the extreme pain you feel because he doesn't stop pulling. After what feels like hours of excruciating oral surgery, you're finally standing outside the dentist's office texting with a friend. Come on, show me, it can't be that bad, reads the message from your friend. You're nervous to send her a picture though, since you have a small crush on the girl and you don't want her to see you in this state. But after she asks you again, you decide to take a quick selfie and send it to her anyway. You snap a photo of your mangled mouth and jaw. The mess of wires had to be hastily applied to move your remaining crooked teeth back into place with blobs of fast-hardening epoxy, and the result looks like a low-budget horror movie prosthetic. You send the message and wait. You watch the dots appear that indicate she's writing a response, then watch as they disappear without a reply. You sadly slip the phone back into your pocket and begin walking away. As you make your way home with your head hung in shame, you keep your mouth shut tight. You don't want any passers-by to see what you've become. You decide to detour through the park to avoid any people as much as possible, and as you walk, you decide to stop at a picnic table next to a small pond. You sit at the table and watch the ducks mill about in the water. They have it so lucky, you think. Ducks never have to worry about their teeth getting knocked out by a baseball and leaving them looking like a monster. The ducks suddenly all start moving away from your side of the pond, eventually taking flight and leaving completely. You get the sense that they're trying to get away from something, and you turn around, but there's nothing behind you. Oh, it must be me, you think. But then you get the sense that there is something behind you, and turn again. Still though, there's nothing. It's just you, the picnic table, and the empty pond. You turn back to watch the still water, but you can't shake the feeling that there's someone behind you, and turn again. Hello? Is anyone there? You ask, but no one answers. You turn back to the pond and… You scream in fright at the thing standing before you and fall back off the picnic table. You get up out of the dirt and you don't wait to stick around to see who or what this thing is. You start to run as fast as you can, but you immediately hear it chasing after you. Instinctually, you take out your phone and start trying to take pictures of whatever it is that's behind you. You know no one will ever believe you, and you want some evidence of this, this thing. You manage to snap off a couple of pictures, but you can hear the creature gaining on you. You scream as your mouth begins to ache. Perhaps running this soon after your surgery is causing your damaged teeth to shift and the pain is intense. It starts to feel like your mouth is full of jagged rocks, but you can feel that it is your teeth pushing out and stabbing into your mouth. You take one last picture before the creature leaps on you, sending you both to the ground and your phone tumbling into the dirt. Early the next morning, a police perimeter has been set up in the park. The detective arrives and walks past the traumatized-looking jogger who must have been the one that discovered the grisly scene. An officer guarding the site lifts up the police tape so the detective can enter the crime scene that surrounds a body lying under a white sheet. The detective asks the officer if they've found anything yet, and the officer hands the detective a plastic bag containing a dirty cell phone. The detective puts on a latex glove and removes the phone from the bag. The screen is cracked, but it still works. There's numerous messages on the screen that look like they're from someone trying to apologize for not responding sooner, and asking where the phone's owner is and if they're mad at her. The detective opens the phone's camera app and starts looking at the last photos that were taken. It's a strange series of pictures. They seem to all be selfies that a young man was taking as he ran through the park. It almost appears as though there's a figure behind him, but it's hard to tell. There's a foggy white vignette on the pictures that gets worse the further he looks, slowly closing in until the last photo is nothing but a blurred milky white screen. The detective flips the phone over and looks at the lens, which you can see is completely covered in a hard white substance. The detective places the phone back in the evidence bag and kneels down next to the body. The police officer turns away, 
He's already seen the victim and doesn't need to again. The detective pulls down the sheet to reveal a truly shocking sight. The boy's mouth is a mess of teeth, far, far too many teeth. There are teeth growing out of every part of his gums at horrible angles, filling his mouth and jutting out at painfully odd angles. Who could have done this? What could have done this? The local police department may not have had any idea what the state of this victim meant, but the SCP Foundation did, because they had seen the same occurrence dozens of times before. In fact, they had seen it happen so many times that they had classified this anomalous entity as SCP-4910, but it had already earned a much more ominous nickname within the Foundation. It was known as The Grinner. Very little is known about SCP-4910, and eyewitness accounts of the creature are all extremely brief due to those who have interacted with it quickly succumbing to its effects. What is known is that SCP-4910 is a quadruped and appears to be made partially, or perhaps entirely, out of teeth. Those who encounter SCP-4910 quickly experience its primary anomalous effect, which is that it causes the extremely rapid overproduction of teeth in its victim's mouths. Existing teeth will quickly increase in size, protruding farther out of the gums than should be able, while new teeth will begin to sprout from any available space in the mouth, including the roof of the mouth and underneath the tongue. These new teeth will completely fill the mouth, which almost immediately inhibits their ability to speak or vocalize at all. The creature will then use this opportunity to attack and incapacitate the victim before starting to feed. Further adding to the mystery of SCP-4910's appearance comes from the effect it has on any nearby recording equipment. Cameras and other devices that come within SCP-4910's proximity will have their critical components compromised by a sudden appearance of a layer of dentin, which is the calcified material that partially makes up teeth. Interestingly, SCP-4910 seems to possess some level of intelligence, as it appears able to differentiate between normal civilians, who it hunts for sustenance, and members of organizations that seek to hunt down and contain or harm it, which it uses for an even more nefarious purpose. While the exact mechanics are still unclear, it seems as though SCP-4910 is able to infect certain anomalous organization members with its ability, causing them to act as a vector for the effect, who then spread it to even more victims. This effect is, of course, of great concern to the Foundation, and containment protocols for infected victims have been hastily put into place. Should a member of staff begin bearing a grin with too many teeth or multiple tooth-filled smiles, they are to be immediately immobilized by any means necessary though preferably with a firearm that allows one to keep an appropriate distance and hopefully prevent any further spread of the effect. The infected individual is then to be doused in a hydrochloric chemical compound that will reduce the afflicted to a pulp-like substance. Once this pulp is no longer animate, it can be transferred to the closest incineration site for disposal. Should a member of personnel have an interaction with SCP-4910 and feel that they were exposed to its anomalous effects, they may be saved by taking immediate medical action. Oral surgery to remove the additional teeth has been found to be effective when the procedure is undergone in the first one to two hours following exposure, though the victim will suffer lifelong permanent physical issues from the procedure. Once three hours have passed, the effect will have spread to the rest of the body, with teeth appearing virtually anywhere. Unfortunately for the victim, should the infection reach this point, pain management has been shown to be ineffective, and there is nothing that can be done to alleviate their suffering, save for termination. SCP-4910 remains at large and has been given the Keter classification. Mobile Task Force Epsilon, codenamed Turfing Black, is the only MTF authorized to respond to sightings, and they have been given permission to engage the creature and utilize lethal force if necessary, due to the danger this anomaly presents specifically to the SCP Foundation. A kindly-looking old woman is carrying groceries into her home. When she closes the door, a crack forms in the wall, and a tile slides down off her roof crashing to the ground and shattering. The next day, the local builder seems confused. he just fixed a similar problem a week ago at another house, and another the week before that. He'll patch this crack just like he did before and repair the roof, but as he does so, he can't help but think he'll be at another house with the same problem soon. Old people are like this sometimes, though, breaking things on purpose to get someone to come visit them. Oh well, as long as the money is right, He'll keep doing the repairs. That evening, the old woman is in bed when she's woken up by something falling onto her face. A crack is opened in the ceiling right above her bed and plaster is falling on her. 
What is happening to this house? She would have to call the builder again in the morning and let him know that it was getting worse. She gets up to clean the plaster dust off her face, but stops halfway to the door. Was that a noise she heard? It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Another noise. She definitely heard something. Is someone in her home? Hello? She cries out. Whoever you are, you better go. My husband is going to be home any moment, and he won't be happy. The noises seem to have stopped. Maybe she was imagining things. Who would rob a poor old woman, after all? She didn't have anything worth taking. She still needs to wash the plaster off her face, though. She listens for a moment, and when she doesn't hear anything else, she opens the bedroom door and screams. The next day, a child stands in front of the house with a look of shock. Was there an earthquake? How could a house end up like this? They ring the doorbell, but there's no answer. They knock on the door and are surprised to find that the door is open. Grandma? The child cries into the quiet house. No response. The child enters and looks around. The house is a mess. Chunks of plaster have fallen off the walls and ceiling. Shelves have fallen over, spilling their contents and there's broken glass from shattered light bulbs everywhere. The boy looks up the stairs and can see that his grandmother's bedroom door is open and the light is on. Grandma, are you up there? Still no response. The child nervously starts up the stairs, gripping the railing tight. They quietly make their way to the bedroom and step into the sliver of light coming from the cracked door. The child pushes the door open to find their grandmother on the floor, only it isn't their grandmother. Whatever this is looks like their grandmother, but like she has been stretched and twisted, her body bent at angles where no joints exist. The child is paralyzed with fear, unable to do anything but stare. But the nightmare isn't over yet, because their grandmother is still alive. Sadly, reports like these are all too common in this small town that is plagued by attacks from SCP-783, also known as the Crooked Man. SCP-783 is an extremely dangerous anomalous creature that is currently plaguing the population of Temby, a small rural village in Oxfordshire, England. Every 12 years during the fall and winter months, SCP-783 will engage in a period of hostile behavior that lasts for roughly 70 days, during which time it will target and attack people who are indoors and alone after sunset. Those targeted by SCP-783 will find that the building they are in rapidly deteriorates, causing damage and creating structural integrity issues. These often appear as cracks on the outside of the building that lead to the buildings taking on a crooked appearance. Unfortunately, while the SCP Foundation is aware of both the location and the periods within which SCP-783 operates, it has so far been unable to prevent any attacks. Additionally, the Foundation has yet to be able to produce either an image or even a physical description of SCP-783 due to the effect it has on recording equipment. Cameras set up to capture the anomaly produce only distorted or corrupted footage, leaving its appearance a mystery. Victims targeted by SCP-783 meet a fate that is, in many ways, worse than death. Their bodies will experience extreme deformations, as their bones suffer dozens of fractures and are stretched and twisted in various unnatural directions. They are then healed by the rapid generation of cartilage and the growth of extra skin to cover the new elongated limbs, leaving the victims a malformed knot of gnarled extremities. Some of the cases are quite severe, with one victim having just their forearm extended to over 2.4 meters and another who was left stretched to 12.5 meters in height. Despite the gruesome injuries suffered, the majority of victims are still alive following the attacks, though they will more often than not be left completely paralyzed in a persistent vegetative state, or both. 27 victims of SCP-783 are currently being held in a long-term care facility within a wing of a local hospital that was requisitioned by the Foundation specifically for the care and treatment of 783 victims. Like many of the anomalies that the SCP Foundation investigates and contains, many of the residents of Tembi appear to have some awareness of the Crooked Man, and the anomaly has become something of a local boogeyman. Researchers have even documented local schoolchildren singing a nursery rhyme that appears connected and may even explain the origins of the creature. It goes, There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane and his catch in crooked creel. He stole a crooked child 
who cried a crooked squeal, and that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A month before a recent SCP-783 period of activity was to begin, a Class D personnel, D-209, was sent to live in a Foundation-owned home in the village. Audio and video recording equipment was set up throughout the house in case the D-Class was targeted, in the hopes that some information could be gleaned should something take place. 43 days after he began living in the house, something finally did. One evening while in bed reading a book, D-209 heard noises on the ground floor of the home. Cameras on the first floor experienced corruption and showed only a distortion moving through the house. When D-209 attempted to leave the bedroom and escape the home, they immediately encountered SCP-783. During a period of time that lasted roughly five hours, their bones were broken numerous times and reset over and over, leaving D-209 a twisted mass of flesh and bone. Strangely, at the exact same time that D-209 was being attacked, all 27 of the living prior SCP-783 victims in the hospital experienced violent seizures, despite most of them having been declared functionally brain-dead and the rest being totally paralyzed. Also concurrent with the attack was a seismic event on the outskirts of town, and the details revealed by this event were both illuminating and extremely disturbing. Foundation personnel were dispatched to the site of the seismic activity to investigate and determine if it was connected to SCP-783 in any way. There, they found a small group of angry townspeople, perhaps frustrated by seemingly unending paranormal events in their town and the lack of progress that had been made to stop them. After a tense standoff, SCP Agent Collins fired her service weapon into the air, and the crowd quickly scattered. Now, free of distraction, the agents could begin their investigation in earnest. They immediately spotted several objects sticking out of the earth. Upon closer inspection, these were identified as elongated human toes. A dig team was sent to the site, and by the next day, a mass grave had been uncovered that was filled with the twisted mass of what appeared to be victims of SCP-783. Their mutated and drawn-out bodies were well-preserved despite being buried directly in the ground, and had all been buried head down, with their arms extending deeper into the burial pit. As one researcher was attempting to take a tissue sample from one of the bodies, the ground beneath him gave way and he fell into the pit. He landed on the tangled mass of limbs which shifted under his weight, and he disappeared into the pit beneath them. Agent Collins immediately found a length of rope, tied it to her waist, and climbed into the pit with instructions to the on-site team to pull her back up when she signaled. Agent Collins descended into the pit beneath the bodies, and after several minutes, she was extracted, though without the missing researcher. At debriefing, she described how she found an anomalous location under the ground beneath 783's victims' corpses, and she was so rattled by what she saw that she was granted a temporary leave of absence. The Foundation had to know more, and a D-Class personnel was quickly selected for exploration of the underground anomaly. D-2172 was equipped with audio and video recording equipment, along with several scientific measurement tools as well as a firearm, and was lowered down into the pit via crane. Their wired tether to the surface would both send the information they collected back as well as serve as their lifeline to the surface. As D-2172 was lowered past the mass of corpses into the darkness, they experienced a sense of vertigo before it was realized that the anomalous effects extended to gravity as well, which had become reversed, and that they would need to start climbing up in order to descend further into the pit. They soon climbed out of the hole surrounded by the reaching, extended arms of corpses and emerged into an open world with an overcast sky. It looked exactly like the town of Tembi, with the same buildings present there as in our world. The world appeared to be uninhabited though, with no sign of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 began investigating the buildings and found them all to be empty as well, though they did unfortunately find signs of a struggle in one house, with what looked to be evidence of the missing researcher's demise. They continued exploring the area and found that the anomalous properties of the location extended to its borders too, and as the D-Class walked north out of the town, after several kilometers they found that they were now somehow back at the southern edge of the town. D-2172 was ordered to return to the entry point, but as they walked, they were suddenly impeded by the deformed body of an SCP-783 victim that stretched across the road in front of them. D-2172 drew and fired their weapon at the entity but it didn't react. 
and they were forced to retreat into the nearby woods. After several minutes, they stopped to rest when they spotted something else. In the distance, the D-Class saw what looked to be a giant white birch tree, and it was coming towards them. As the living tree approached, it became clear that it wasn't a tree at all. What looked like branches were extended bony fingers that it was using to walk. The long, branch-like fingers were coming out of the top of the tree, where D-2172 could see their origin. These branches were the elongated fingers of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 turned to run as the giant living tree chased them back into the town, firing their weapon at the creature whenever they had the chance, but was unable to stop it. The visual feed was soon lost as the audio continued to broadcast the screams of D-2172. But this wasn't the end of the expedition. The on-site team was surprised to witness after several hours that the tether was pulled on twice, the signal that it should be reeled in. A medical team was sent to the site, since it was assumed that D-2172 would need immediate care, and the team began reeling in the line. After several minutes, they spotted the harness that should have been strapped to D-2172, but with nothing in it. They continued to pull, but the harness became stuck on the mass of corpses in the pit. They then noticed that it wasn't actually stuck. There was a hand holding onto the harness for dear life. It was D-2172's hand. The team kept pulling as D-2172's arm kept stretching out of the pit to a length of over three meters. But eventually, the resistance became too much. D-2172 lost its grip, and it was seen sinking back into the mass of corpses inside the pit. Following this expedition, it was determined that only special operations teams and mobile task forces would be used to explore the dangerous anomalous location in the future. At least three such expeditions have been undertaken, though the details remain classified for the time being, and perhaps it is for the best if they remain so. The SCP Foundation will continue to monitor the town of Tembe in an attempt to learn more about SCP-783 and hopefully discover a means to contain it and its related phenomena. Due to the difficulty in containing the anomaly, it has been classified as Keter, and a local building adjacent to the Tembe Hospital has been requisitioned and designated as Provisional Site-5 in order to accommodate the increased Foundation presence. As the SCP Foundation continues to research this mysterious and highly dangerous anomaly, any victims of SCP-783 are to be retrieved, their injuries catalogued, and then their bodies are to be incinerated. A child is sleeping happily in their bed, dreaming of Christmas morning. What they don't hear as they sleep is the sound of SCP-4666 slipping into their room. SCP-4666 watches the child for just a moment before reaching into a giant bag. Hi. I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-4666, also known as the Yule Man. SCP-4666 is thought to be a single humanoid entity, but one that has been alive for an incredibly long time. Those who have come into contact with SCP-4666 and live to tell the tale describe him as being very tall, between 2 and 2.3 meters. He also appears to be very old and very thin. He always appears without clothing, even when the weather is below freezing and would be much too cold for any normal human to survive. Though the true extent of his anomalous properties are still unknown, SCP-4666 seems to be able to travel instantaneously to any location on Earth above the 40th line of North Latitude, and may actually be able to travel anywhere on the planet. Encounters with SCP-4666 have only been reported during a very specific time of year, a period of 12 nights running from the night of December 21st to the early morning hours of January 2nd. This period is known as SCP-4666's active phase, and the encounters with the anomalous humanoid creature have been termed Weissnacht events. During these events, SCP-4666 appears at family dwellings, all of which, so far, have a few things in common. 1. They are all isolated in rural areas. 2. They are in locations with snow that covers the area for the duration of the event. And 3. They are all home to a family with at least one child under the age of 8. In places that match all of those characteristics, 
Weissnacht events sometimes occur and always follow the same basic progression. During the first seven nights, the children will report seeing a strange figure within the vicinity of the home. The entity will seem to be watching the home from a distance, such as from across a field or from the edge of a nearby forest. Some children have even reported waking up at night to find SCP-4666 watching them sleep through a window. On nights 8 through 11, other family members will report hearing the entity, such as footsteps on the roof or in the attic. A bad-smelling odor will also start to be noticed in the house, but no source of the smell is ever found. These strange occurrences will often lead the family to think their house may be haunted, or that they're being terrorized by a madman. Finally, on the twelfth night, one of two scenarios can occur. In the first, which happens roughly 15% of the time, families will often report that they heard footsteps during the night inside of their house. But there is never any sign of forced entry like broken windows or doors. In the morning, the children will find crudely made toys at the foot of their beds. For the lucky ones, this is the end of the Weissnacht event for them. The roughly 85% who experience the other scenario are considerably less lucky. In the vast majority of cases, the twelfth night is a horrible experience. SCP-4666 still enters the home on the final night, but rather than leave presents for the children, it incapacitates the family and moves them all into a single room where it proceeds to kill them one by one in view of the rest of the family. The exact method of killing varies from event to event, but there's almost always an element of torture that occurs before they are finally killed, and this torture may serve a ritualistic purpose. The entire family is killed except for one of the children who is under the age of eight. This child is instead abducted and placed into a giant bag SCP-4666 carries with it. SCP-4666's existence was first noted in 1974 by the Foundation's then-new Anomalous Signature Recognition Program, which alerted the Foundation to several suspiciously similar home invasions and murders that occurred throughout the Northern Hemisphere on the night of January 1st. Further research uncovered evidence for what was most likely other Weissnacht events every single year, dating back all the way to the late 18th century, with there being, on average, a little more than three events per year. And there's even been evidence of references to what may be SCP-4666, dating all the way back to the 1st and 2nd century AD. Identical fingerprints have been found at all of the houses which match the conditions for Weissnacht events, and have been matched to a recovered partial print from all the way back in 1873. These fingerprints have characteristics that don't match any known human fingerprints, and the human-like white hairs that have also been recovered do not appear to contain human DNA, or any DNA at all for that matter. In the rare Weissnacht events where SCP-4666 does not murder the family and gifts are left behind, the gifts are anything but normal. The gifts, known as SCP-4666-As, appear to be made from the bodies of children that SCP-4666 abducted from other homes. In one case, from 2018, at the home of a family in Alaska, a life-size doll made from the body of a female child was left behind. The doll was wearing a dirty dress made from sewn-together rags that was in some places sewn directly to the skin. Her mouth had been sewn shut and painted red with human blood. Another child's fingernails had been glued over her own, and three fingers were missing completely. The scalp had also been replaced with another child's scalp and hair like a crude wig. Worst of all, both eyes had been removed and replaced with two stones which were painted to look like eyes. But most frightening of all was that the child who had been turned into a doll was somehow still alive. Authorities took the girl to a hospital where she was able to give a brief interview. She explained that the man who abducted her had killed her parents before putting her into a giant bag where there were other children too. SCP-4666 took the children somewhere deep below the earth in a cave system full of ice and bones. There, they were forced to make crude toys until they couldn't go on any longer, at which point they became toys. The girl, now known to be Ekaterina Morozova, 
had been abducted two years previously in a known Weissnacht event. She survived for only 18 hours after being discovered. An autopsy revealed many terrible injuries, and the cause of death was found to be from severe, sustained malnourishment. SCP-4666 has been classified as Keter and is currently not contained. The Foundation monitors web traffic and law enforcement channels for any evidence of SCP-4666 activity, and especially any potential Weissnacht events, such as cases of stalking reported during the 12-night active phase or other strange phenomena at houses with young children. Should a Weissnacht event be suspected to be in progress, the nearest containment task force is dispatched to attempt to contain SCP-4666 using the standard PDP-8 humanoid first contact protocols. So far, no such containment attempt has been successful. A 7-year-old girl and her 13-year-old brother are settling in for their favorite after-school activity, watching TV. The children's parents won't be home from work for several hours, and watching the after-school programming together before making a snack is a staple of their day. The boy takes his normal position on the couch as the girl plants herself right in front of the television and turns it on. This is the time when Pretty Pony Paradise comes on and she never misses an episode. Her brother would prefer something else, but he also loves to see his sister happy, so he always lets her watch the ponies have their adventures. Today though, when she turns to the right channel, there's something else. Instead of the usual Pretty Pony theme song, circus music comes out of the television speakers. The girl watches as the brightly colored words, Bobble the Clown, appear on the screen. Hey. This isn't pretty ponies, she says to her brother, but when she looks back, he's asleep. The girl isn't happy, but she decides to give this new show a chance. And maybe her pony show will come on after anyway. The circus music stops, and a happy-looking clown cartwheels onto the screen. Hello, kids, the garish clown says. Do you like fun? The girl did like fun. Perhaps this new show wouldn't be so bad. She watches as Bobble walks down the street of an average, happy American small town. Everyone seems to love the happy clown, waving at him as he passes by. Bobble pauses in front of a house where a man is mowing the lawn. He convinces the man to stop his yard work and join him, and the two happily head down the sidewalk together. The girl is a little confused by this show, there's not much in the way of jokes, but she decides to keep watching anyway. Bobble and his new friend stop in front of a house that is painted to resemble a circus tent. This must be where Bobble lives. He invites the man in, and they both enter the house. Inside, Bobble motions for the man to sit while he prepares some refreshments. The girl watches as Bobble moves to the kitchen. There, he begins sharpening knives as he explains directly to the camera the best way to prepare meat the way the skin must carefully be removed from the flesh, and how the bones should be saved for future soup stocks. The girl watches with fascination as Bobble teaches his special lesson. Maybe this is a good show after all. Maybe this is her new favorite show. The girl gets up, her brother still asleep, and heads to the kitchen. She pulls out a drawer to help her reach the counter where the knife block is located, and pulls out the meat cleaver. She looks at it gleaming in the light, entranced by its sharp, shiny edge. The girl returns to the living room and gets up onto the couch next to her sleeping brother. She watches as Bobble steps away from his pot of red, boiling meat and looks right into the camera. The girl stands up and holds up the meat cleaver. Bobble walks towards the camera with fascination in his eyes, as if he can see through the screen and is watching the girl. She slowly raises the knife above her head as Bobble starts whispering, Come on, do it, licking his lips in anticipation. The girl pauses for a second, looks at her sleeping brother one more time, and brings the cleaver down. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-993, also known as Bobble the Clown. But first, there's something I need from you. I need your help to spread the word about some of the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives, and the best way you can help is to subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This will help me bring you more and more SCP videos. Now, back to our file. 
SCP-993 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a children's television program entitled Bobble the Clown. At first glance, the Bobble the Clown show appears to be a standard children's educational cartoon with bright colors, a mascot, and a rote formula that involves the titular character of Bobble the Clown learning a new skill or engaging in a new activity. The program appears to have no recurring supporting cast, with Bobble being the only character who returns to each episode. The settings usually change between episodes as well, with Bobble often being seen in a new or unique location. Despite appearing as a show made for children, the anomalous properties exhibited by this strange television program make themselves apparent almost immediately. First, anyone older than the age of 10 who watches the show will immediately fall unconscious as soon as it begins, and will remain in a comatose state until the program ends. Upon waking, they will report having felt a painful, stabbing headache just prior to falling unconscious. The show's most disturbing property, though, is what has been described by those under the age of 10 who are able to view the program. They report seeing Bobble the Clown teach lessons similar to the way many children's shows extol the virtues of good hygiene or going to bed on time. But with Bobble, the lessons are quite different. Topics that Bobble has presented lessons on and encouraged children to try have included torture, murder, and even cannibalism. As the subject watches, the lessons appear to become ingrained in their minds, and repeated exposure to the show has resulted in permanent effects that resemble symptoms of psychosis and schizophrenia. Documented episodes of Bobble the Clown have included Bobble in the Big City, in which Bobble appears in a large United States city reminiscent of New York, and instructs the viewer on various ways to avoid detection when lighting fires with common resources like mosquito coils. The episode ends with Bobble setting fire to a large building before he exits the screen. The camera continues to stay locked on the burning building for several more minutes as the sound of screams can be heard. In another titled Bobble's Sneaky Saturday, Bobble is again in a major city, this time one that looks similar to London, England, with the Elizabeth Tower containing Big Ben visible in the background. In this episode, Bobble is shown to be quietly following a woman as she walks into her home. Once she arrives, Bobble attacks her with a large butcher knife before giving the audience tips on how to remain unnoticed in crowded places. Bobble gets the truth, finds the clown in a prisoner of war camp, where Bobble is shown torturing a captured soldier as he asks him nonsensical questions that the soldier cannot possibly answer. This continues until the prisoner dies, after which Bobble details methods for inflicting painful but non-lethal injuries. Bobble Hates You is one of the most unnerving of the documented episodes, and consists of Bobble sitting alone in a blank room, silently and angrily staring at the viewer for a full 30 minutes. But the strangest of all is from an episode title filled with expletives, in which Bobble appears to be in a Foundation Secure Site video archive room, the same one where recordings of Bobble the Clown are stored. In this episode, a rage-filled Bobble describes methods for breaching several SCPs' containment. He then gives personal details about the researchers assigned to these SCPs, including their daily routines, before offering several potential ways to murder them. An interesting detail about this episode, at one point, an animated depiction of a particular SCP Foundation researcher is seen to walk past Bobble. A clock on the wall shows the time and this same researcher later confirmed that they did, in fact, walk through the video archive at this exact time, but had no recollection of seeing an animated clown filming a television program in the room when they did so. Episodes of Bobble the Clown continue to be broadcast from an unknown source, but future episodes are to be intercepted using Protocol Upsilon Beta 3 to prevent them from being seen by the public. All broadcasts are recorded for the Foundation's archives, and in order to perform research on the anomaly, subjects under the age of 10 must be used to view them. Once the viewers have described what takes place in the episode, they are then to immediately be administered Class A amnestics. Despite the danger these episodes pose to those who view them, since they are able to be reliably blocked from public broadcast, SCP-993 has been classified as safe, and for now, Bobble the Clown appears to be contained as well as it can be. And the lights go out on Maple Street as a young woman takes stock of her marriage and the man she once thought she knew. She sits at the kitchen counter, absently stirring a cup of tea that went cold hours ago, but she just can't bring herself to stand and heat it back up. 
She glances at the baby monitor sitting next to her, grabs it, and holds it to her ear. Steady, peaceful breathing. The baby is fine. No one needs a thing from her right now. She stares at the seat across from her, where her husband sits every morning, sharing coffee and breakfast before they start the day. She glances at the clock. 8 p.m. He'll be home soon. She'll have to face him, have to find a way to look him in the eye, force a smile. Pretend she doesn't know that he's getting home two hours late from who knows where. The thought turns her stomach. It wasn't always like this. Their marriage wasn't always a tense charade, their home a haunted house. He was sweet that first year. He'd buy her flowers and take her out to dinner. He'd kiss her in the morning before they'd even brush their teeth. He wouldn't come home smelling like his secretary's perfume. But ever since the baby, something's been different. The light behind his eyes has gone dim. He won't help with late night feedings, won't change diapers. Most of the time, he acts as if the baby doesn't exist. His own son. He just comes home, stares vacantly at the TV, and expects her to handle everything without so much as a single complaint. She hasn't slept in weeks. She hasn't been down to her art studio in the basement in months. Then, a sound shakes her from her thoughts. She hears the unmistakable rumble of a car pulling into the driveway and fixes a stiff smile on her face. Maybe she'll leave him. Maybe tonight she'll work up the courage to say those words that will change everything. I want a divorce. The baby barely has a father now. What difference would it really make? The woman's husband stumbles through the door, lipstick on his collar and the smell of whiskey on his breath. He greets her with a kiss on the cheek, more out of obligation than anything else, and grabs himself a can of soda from the fridge. She offers him some stew from the stovetop. He brushes her off, saying, I already ate. She doesn't bother asking when or how, when he supposedly came straight home from work. There's no point. She knows he'll only lie. Do you want to say goodnight to the baby? She asks. It's a test, as she watches his face for any flicker of fatherly affection. Isn't it asleep by now? It. He calls their son, It. He's sleeping, but you could still go up and see him, if you're quiet. I had a long day. I'm tired. I'll see you in the morning. She can't help herself. Him. What was that? Him. He's not a thing. He's our child. He sets the can on the coffee table with a heavy clatter. Do you have to nitpick every word that comes out of my mouth? She deflates at the outburst. No. He sighs, shaking his head. Don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. She averts her eyes, looking down. Fine. I'll go up and check on him. You enjoy your relaxation time. That's it. Tonight is the night. She's going to pack a bag tonight. She'll leave and start a new life, just her and her son. He won't even miss them when they're gone. It'll be better for everyone this way. She'll just go upstairs, check the baby, wait for him to fall asleep. Then she'll just cut and run. It's not like he deserves a proper goodbye from her. She can go away, go to her sister's place. As she fantasizes about leaving him, spending peaceful days in a little country house with her son and maybe a dog, she finds that the baby has spit up all over his pajamas. She scoops him up into her arms to make sure everything is okay otherwise, and he's fine, just a mess. As she holds him, he stirs awake and begins to cry. Oh, sweetheart, oh, I need to change you and give you a bath. Shh, sh it's okay, you're all right. What's wrong? Her husband's voice comes from the doorway, startling her. It doesn't concern you. She can't help herself. Her resentment creeps into her voice. He just needs a bath. What, you think I can't bathe my own son? He scoffs. That's it? Well, you haven't done it yet. So, when she turns to look at her husband, there are tears in his eyes. I'll do it now. Something in his voice is so sincere, she falters in her determination for a moment. Maybe he'll really try. Maybe things will go back to how they used to be. And she really, really needs a rest. So she hands the baby over to him and sits down in the soft chair in the corner of the nursery. Before too long, the exhaustion overcomes her and she nods off. In her sleep, she can't see her husband leaving the bathroom to go downstairs and catch the last 20 minutes of the Dodgers game, leaving the baby alone in the tub. When she stirs awake, the crib is still empty. She can hear the water running and she knows. She just knows what has happened. What she let happen, no what he did. A glance into the bathroom confirms her suspicions, and with a primal scream of pain, rage, and heartbreak, she tears down the stairs to confront the murderer himself. She finds him asleep on the couch and takes a moment to catch her breath, to wipe the tears from her eyes. 
Did he do it by accident or on purpose to punish her, to free himself from their marriage once and for all, to break her heart beyond repair? It doesn't matter in the end. What's done is done, whether he meant it or not. But what can she do? What could ever make this right? She wants to scream, to set the house on fire, to tear him to shreds. Then she spots it. The baseball bat leaned against the wall by the door in case of an intruder. She picks it up, feeling the weight of the wood in her hands, the heft of it. Swung hard enough with real intent behind it, it could really do some damage. Slowly, thoughtfully, she walks back toward the couch, raises the bat, and swings. It only takes one good hit to get the job done, but she swings the bat a few more times anyway as something inside of her bends and bends and breaks. Until the tears stop falling, until her vision comes back and everything stops looking like a wash of red. He doesn't even scream, never wakes from his stupor to see the look on his wife's face when she gets her revenge. He's just gone. She wipes the red from her eyes and lets the bloody bat drop to the floor. She started the day as a wife, as a mother, but now she's ending it as a killer. He deserved it, she tells herself. He took her baby from her, so she got him back. But why doesn't she feel any relief? Why does she still feel the gnawing grief in the pit of her stomach, feel the darkness clawing at her heart? First things first, she needs to get him out of the living room, out of sight of prying eyes and nosy neighbors. She could try to bury him, but where? The yard isn't exactly private and she's not sure how much she could even dig up before sunrise. No, that won't do. Then the idea hits her, and she grabs him by the arms and begins dragging the lifeless body of the man she once loved toward the basement stairs. He's heavy, much heavier than she expected, but she supposed they called it dead weight for a reason. She grunts and struggles as she drags him down the stairs, wincing as his head bumps against the steps, before reminding herself, he's not using it anymore. She surprises herself with a laugh, a dry sound echoing in the empty basement. She drags him past the last chair, and he lands on the floor with a thud in the room that she converted into her home art studio when they first bought the house, back when things were still good. Her eyes dart about the room, the half-finished paintings, the wood carvings she abandoned when she got pregnant, the paints and long dried out lumps of clay, the potter's wheel in the corner. Her eyes settle on a metal frame, large and twisted into a vaguely human shape. She had crafted it years ago, intending to cover it with concrete and paint it, but never got around to it. No, she had been forced to put it away. Her husband hadn't liked it, had thought it was creepy and odd, and didn't want her working with such heavy materials. Just another thing he took from her, another dream he destroyed. It's just about his size, now that she takes a look at it with him lying limply on the ground so close by. With a little bit of muscle, some determination, he would fit right inside and there are the tubs of cement, still sealed tight and ready to mix, just as she left them. She could shove him into the frame, paint him with layer on layer of cement, and it would be like he had disappeared in the night. A fitting coffin for the man, she thought. The perfect place to hide him, too. No one would ever know. No bones to dig up in the garden out back, no smell of rot seeping out from beneath the floorboard. She smiled to herself, just a little bit. In death, her husband would help her finish her greatest work. She didn't consider herself a wife or a mother, not anymore, but she was still an artist, and he would be her art. As she mixes the cement, she hums a little song to herself, beginning to feel something like peace. Everything is ruined, her life as she knew it completely turned upside down, but she is here in the art studio, creating again. Not a waste of time now, is it? She remarks to her husband's body. He doesn't answer. Typical. Why get an art degree, you said? Well, it prepared me for this, didn't it? I wonder what I'll do with you when you're done. Maybe I'll keep you down here. That seems like a waste. Maybe I'll get you displayed in a gallery. Let people buy tickets to take a look at you. You'll be my masterpiece. You'd hate that, wouldn't you? Me thriving, creating, all without you there to make snide comments and treat me like dirt. As she waits for the concrete to become usable, she turns her attention back to the metal frame. Time to put her ex-husband in his place. She lifts him and begins to wedge his body into the metal structure. He's heavy, getting heavier all the time, and left a trail of blood behind on the floor that she would have to clean up and bleach later, but after several sweaty minutes, he is in place. He looks correct to her, sitting there in the frame, ready to become something new, something different, 
something better than he ever was in life. The concrete is ready, and she begins to smooth it over the body and metal frame, flush and blood, and sweat and grit, layer upon layer upon layer. Mix, smooth, wait, mix, smooth, wait. All the while she talks to him, weeps bitter tears into the concrete. At one point, she pricks her finger, her blood dripping into the mixture and becoming part of the sculpture. For days she carries on this way, not breaking to eat, bathe, or sleep. After three days pass, she runs out of concrete, but the sculpture is not finished. She'll need to go out and get more. She takes a shower, washing away the dust, the blood, and the guilt, changes into fresh, clean clothes, and takes a drive into town. She picks up more concrete first, telling the clerk some story about home improvements she's working on. He asks if she's married, if her husband will be helping with the work. I'm recently separated, she replies. On the way home, a small store catches her eye. It's a place she's driven by plenty of times, a little occult shop filled with herbs and tapered candles and strange leather-bound books. She isn't sure if she believes in this sort of thing, not really, but something makes her park and walk inside anyway. A gnarled old woman behind the counter spots her, and without speaking, points her toward a room in the back. It's different there, darker, filled with vials of thick, dark liquid, shelves full of skulls that might be human, though she isn't sure. In the back of the room, there is a bottle of paint, deep red and vibrant. What it's doing here, she couldn't be certain, but as soon as she sets eyes on it, she knows she needs to have it, needs to add it to her sculpture to make it truly complete. She brings it to the woman at the counter, but she just says, take it, no charge, I can tell you really need it. Just be careful what you use it for, it's powerful stuff. She wants to ask what that means, what's so powerful about this little bottle of strange red paint but she doesn't. She's much too exhausted and much too determined to get back home and put the finishing touches on her masterpiece. She drives straight home and hauls the concrete and paint inside, carrying it down into the basement. She's dizzy from hunger and lack of sleep, but she doesn't care. She has one singular vision right now, and she must see it carried out. She mixes more concrete and slathers the whole shape again, sculpting out the round, bulbous head, the arms at its sides, the legs and feet the curve of the whole figure covered in thick gray sludge, in potential, a blank canvas. Before it dries, she opens the paint. It smells musty, rich, and somehow ancient. It clings to the bristles of her brush like a living thing and takes to the surface of the sculpture eagerly, spreading out as if of its own volition as she brushes it on evenly. She paints the whole thing, every inch of it. At first, it doesn't seem as if there will be enough paint to finish the job. But somehow, that little bottle coats the whole figure in deep, dark red. She looks down at her hands, stained just as brightly as they were when she swung that baseball bat. She looks back up at her creation, the amalgamation of the fear, the pain, the heartbreak, the pure, primal rage, and begins to cry. The tears fall freely into her palms, and without thinking, she smears them into the concrete and paint until they disappear into the art. Then she takes a step back, watching it all dry. All of that work, all of that time, that great yawning chasm of loss, and this is what she has made of it. She loves it, and she hates it all at once, and she can't stop staring at the place where its eyes would be if it had them. She half expects to see something looking back. She shakes her head, looking down at the floor for a moment. Then she hears the sound of stone and metal grinding together. Her gaze snaps back up and she sees that the sculpture has moved just a little, its head turned in her direction. In an instant, her husband's words come back to her, don't look at me like that. I can't stand when you stare at me like that. It couldn't be. She stares at it for a long time, her eyes watering from the effort. She blinks, her eyes open, and the sculpture is gone. There it is again, the grind of metal and stone against each other. Then, with the sound of bones snapping, everything went dark. Her hate, her vengeance, her desperate act of violence and creation, with a splash of the most unusual paint, led to the creation of a deadly masterpiece that would one day be known as SCP-173. A businessman steps out of his hotel room holding a silver ice bucket. He looks up and down the empty hallway until he spots what he was searching for, an ice machine. He slips his room key into his pocket and heads down the hall towards the machine. As he waits for the machine to fill his bucket with ice, he glances around and spots something. 
There, at the end of the hall, it looks like someone is sticking their head out from around the corner, watching him. But then they suddenly disappear. He doesn't think much of it. It's probably just some kid playing around. His ice bucket is only a quarter full. These old machines can be really slow. He looks around again and sees the same head poking around the corner, looking at him. He thinks it might be a young girl, but as he squints to get a better look, she disappears around the corner once again. The ice machine finally finishes filling his bucket. He picks it up and starts to walk back towards his room, but stops. He turns around and looks down the hall to see the same girl there again, watching him with a creepy, unblinking stare. Do you want something? The man asks down the hallway, but there's no response from the girl. She simply keeps looking at him. Are you just going to keep staring at me? That's exactly what she does. The businessman is really starting to get annoyed now. All he wanted to do was unwind with a drink after a long day at a job site. Why does this girl want to keep messing with him? He starts walking down the hall towards her. I don't know what you think you're playing at, the businessman says as he walks down the hallway in her direction. When he gets halfway to her, she disappears behind the corner once again. But the businessman keeps walking and talking to her. But if you don't stop messing with me, I'll... He rounds the corner and sees... Nothing. There's a short hallway that leads to a maintenance closet, but no girl. Did she somehow slip inside the closet? He didn't hear the door, but she couldn't be anywhere else. He sets down the ice bucket on the floor and reaches towards the handle with more than a little apprehension. He feels uneasy for some reason, and maybe even a little scared. But there's nothing to be afraid of. It was just a girl, wasn't it? He grabs the handle and opens the door. Aha! I've got you. There's nothing in the closet. Just a couple of mops, a bucket, and some cleaning supplies. He pushes the mops aside as if she could somehow be hiding behind them, but no. There's no place to hide or secret doors to be found. He really must have imagined the whole thing. It was a long day, and a long flight before that. He needed that drink. He sticks his room key into the door and pulls it out. A green light flashes and the lock clicks open. He grabs the handle to open the door when he realizes he's forgotten something. The ice bucket, the whole reason he left his room to begin with. He walks back down the hallway and past the ice ma- Wait a second. Where's the ice machine? Isn't this where it was? The alcove where he could have sworn he got ice just minutes before is empty. He looks around, up and down the hallway. Did he somehow get turned around? He walks to the end of the hall and turns the corner. Sitting there on the floor in front of the maintenance closet door is the ice bucket. He looks around, confusion on his face, and picks up the ice bucket. Back at his room, he puts his room key into the door. The lock flashes red. He tries the key again, and once more it flashes red. He tries the key a third time, and as he does so, the door opens. He looks up to see a large man standing in front of him. Do you need something? The businessman is confused. What are you doing in my room? He asks. Your room, the large man responds. Yeah, room 237. The large man looks annoyed. He shoves past the businessman and points across the hall. The businessman follows his finger's direction to see that he's pointing at another door, one that has the number 237 next to it on the wall. The businessman looks at the number next to the door he's been trying to unlock, 239. The businessman laughs nervously at his mistake as the large man pushes past him again and closes the door behind him. Back in his room, the businessman can finally sit down and pour himself a drink. He takes two ice cubes from the bucket and drops them in his glass before taking a long sip. Ah. He turns on the TV, but after watching for a few minutes, he finds that he's having a hard time concentrating. Whatever this show is, it moves too fast and he can't keep track of what's happening. He turns off the TV and picks up a book instead. Maybe some reading will help him to relax and get his bearings. He still feels really… off. He opens the book, but gets confused. Is this the same book he bought in the airport? It looks like it's written in a foreign language. It's just a bunch of squiggles. He tosses the book on the table and yawns. It's not that late, but he's feeling really tired. He gets up, kicks off his shoes, and lies down on the bed without bothering to undress. He's too tired for that. He mumbles to himself for a moment, half awake, talking about how he needs to return that foreign book when he goes back to the airport. What were they trying to do selling him something he can't even read? He continues to mumble about the things he'll do to the cashier who sold him the book for a while until he finally drifts off to sleep. His eyes open. It's dark. He must have been sleeping for a while. The room is cold, too. He goes to pull the blankets up over him, but immediately realizes that he can't move. Try as he might, his body won't respond. Not a single muscle. 
Only his eyes seem to work. He's completely paralyzed. He can't even yell for help. What happened? And what is he going to do? Did he have a stroke? Is he dying? As his mind races through all the different possibilities, he suddenly sees something. From his bed in the dark room, he can just barely make out the door to his hotel room, and he is terrified by what he can see coming through it. A figure has appeared in the door, literally in the door, as if it is phasing through the solid wood. The man is scared to death as the thing fully enters his room and turns to look right at him. The man wants to scream, but his mouth is still completely numb. The figure starts crawling towards him. He can see now that it's small, smooth, and completely white. He fights as hard as he can, willing his body to move, but nothing happens. He can't so much as whisper. The thing climbs up onto the bed and sits down right on his chest. He prays that he is dreaming, telling himself to wake up over and over again as the creature leans his face in close to his. It seems as if it is somehow looking at him with its smooth, eyeless sockets. It tilts its head slightly to the side and… Welcome, I'm Dr. Bob, and we couldn't be happier that you've decided to stay with us as we delve into SCP-5172, an extremely dangerous anomaly that is known by the extremely non-threatening name of North American Hotel Ice Machines. SCP-5172 is a phenomenon that only affects guests staying at hotels located on the North American continent. It is unknown how or what causes these guests to become affected, but those that are will begin to notice something. Ice machines in the hallway of the hotel they are staying in. Now you might think this sounds perfectly normal. After all, don't most hotels have ice machines? If you just had this thought, then I have some bad news for you, because there is a high probability that you too may have been affected by SCP-5172. You see, ice machines are actually extremely uncommon in hotels and it is likely that you have never actually seen one, or at least, not a real one. Allow me to explain. In the 1950s, the founder of the Holiday Inn chain of hotels, Kenan Williams, had an idea that he thought would set his hotel apart and attract customers, which was to offer more perks and amenities than his competitors. For example, he implemented a new policy where children would be allowed to stay for free, something most hotels charged extra for. Hotels at the time also had a policy of making their guests pay for ice, but Williams decided to change that by installing ice machines in his hotels. Sadly, the marketing stunt didn't work. The cost of the machines wasn't made up for in new customers, and the plan was discontinued by the mid-1960s. The vast majority of the machines were removed, with the rest being pulled from the hotels as they would break down since they were no longer worth the expense of maintaining. Despite the fact that they only existed in hotels for a brief period of time, there is still a widely held belief among the public that ice machines can be found in nearly every hotel. In a poll of the general population conducted by the Foundation, over 80% of adults claim to have memories of seeing an ice machine in a hotel, a number that is quite literally impossible. Just where this mass delusion came from, or why it persists, is currently unknown, but it's theorized to be related to the SCP-5172 phenomenon in some way. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-5172 in 1973 after a series of unsolved murders occurred at hotels in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Foundation investigators soon discovered the prevalence of false ice machine memories and installed a number of hidden cameras around the hotels in both their public spaces as well as in the rooms themselves. It was after viewing the footage captured by these cameras that the Foundation finally got their first look at just what happens during an occurrence of SCP-5172 which has been dubbed a Zalmunna event. The Zalmunna event is triggered whenever a guest at the hotel sees and then uses an ice machine. The moment they use the ice machine, the event cannot be stopped unless certain actions are taken, but more on that later. The targeted individual who used the ice machine will immediately begin to have the sense that they are being watched. This usually comes in the form of an unknown individual who appears to be looking at them from the end of the hall where the ice machine is located. Third-party observers are unable to see the person who is supposedly watching the target, nor do they appear on any recording devices, visual or otherwise. The targets have described the watchers in various ways, leading the Foundation to believe that they may actually be nothing more than hallucinations. Shortly after, the targeted individual will begin to experience feelings of confusion and fatigue, not dissimilar to the symptoms of early-stage dementia. The longer it takes the target to return to their hotel room, the more pronounced these feelings will become and they will soon have issues completing everyday tasks and will experience short-term memory loss. Despite these feelings of fatigue and disorientation, targets report that their mind feels too active to fall asleep, 
anywhere other than a hotel room bed, that is. This feeling will usually cause the target to seek out their own hotel room, though they may have difficulty finding it due to their confused state. They don't need to sleep in their own room for the next stage of the Zalmunna event to be triggered, though. Sleeping in any hotel room will do. Once the target lies down in a hotel room bed, they will immediately enter the hypnagogic state, which is the confusing and dreamlike state that one experiences in between full sleep and waking. The temperature of the room will begin to lower during this period as well, until it reaches approximately 11 degrees Celsius or 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit. After about an hour, the target will enter a state of deep sleep, at which point SCP-5172-1 will finally make its appearance. The humanoid-like entity is quite diminutive in size, standing just 4 feet tall and appearing to weigh a little over 60 pounds. Its arms are twice as long as normal humans though, and the top of its head is enlarged as well. Though it is not visible to observers present in the room, cameras are able to record the creature. After phasing through the door of the hotel room, the 5172-1 entity will begin crawling towards the sleeping person, who will wake up to find that they are in a state of sleep paralysis. The entity will climb up onto the bed and sit on the person's chest. It will move its smooth-skinned face close to the targets before opening its mouth, revealing a long, thin, proboscis-like appendage that it inserts into the target's eye socket. It's long been theorized that it may be administering some type of paralytic or anesthesia directly into the brain, so that it can then engage in the next stage of the Zalmana event, harvesting. The 5172-1 entity's chest then opens to reveal a pair of tools. It will take the tools out of its chest and use them to begin extracting 4 centimeter cubes directly from the target's body. Flesh, muscle, organs, and even bone will all be cut and scooped out with the same ease, which it then places inside of its own chest cavity. While it starts the process extremely slow, collecting just 2 cubes per minute at first, it quickly ups its pace to as many as 50 cubes per minute, leading to the entire harvesting process typically lasting 2 to 3 hours. Once it has finished harvesting, the creature will simply place its tools back inside its chest cavity, crawl back towards the hotel room door, and phase through it once more. But the horror is far from over. SCP-5172-1 collects all of the organic material from the target during the harvesting process, all except for the central nervous system, which includes the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, the retinas, and the brain. These are left lying on the hotel room bed after 5172-1 carefully cut and scooped around them. And the truly horrifying aspect of the Zalmana event is that the target is still alive at this point and will continue to live for several more hours in this condition. Even worse, reports from targets who had the Zalmana event interrupted while in the middle of the harvesting process described being fully conscious the entire time. It now appears that the proboscis-like appendage that 5172-1 inserts into the target's eye does not appear to be an anesthetic agent at all, since the same rescued targets reported feeling excruciating pain. Instead, it seems that the purpose of the entity's appendage is to ensure that the victim stays conscious through the whole process, fully aware of each cube being removed from their body, helpless to do a thing to stop it. As mentioned, the triggering of a Zalmana event is not a guaranteed death sentence and can be stopped. While much faster than humans, SCP-5172-1 entities aren't especially strong and sustain damage much like a human would. Once it begins harvesting, the entity will become visible to others and can be terminated by the same methods that would kill a human, such as with gunshots or stab wounds. However, simply killing the entity isn't enough. The affected ice machine must be physically removed from the premises in order to prevent a new instance of SCP-5172-1 from materializing. Once triggered through the use of an affected ice machine, the only way to completely stop a Zalmana event is for the target to leave the hotel and sleep in a private residence, which will prevent SCP-5172-1 from appearing. If the target sleeps in any bed in the same or even a different hotel, the event will continue. Efforts are underway to better understand SCP-5172-1 entities by capturing a live specimen, but so far, all attempts have resulted in failure. Captured entities are capable of manifesting their tools and cutting out of containment, while all attempts at binding or otherwise tying down the creatures has led to them dying within several minutes. Autopsies of dead instances have revealed that, like us, they have a circulatory system, though its heart is located in its head, which explains how they can be killed by being shot or stabbed, but they lack respiratory and digestive organs. As you can imagine, 
The existence of SCP-5172 presents a problem for Foundation personnel and their business travel. Agents who must stay in hotels rather than SCP safe houses are briefed on the anomaly and required to wear heart rate monitors that can detect when an elevated heart rate occurs that may be connected to a Zalmana event. Social media, text messages, and other forms of communication from devices that are connected to hotel Wi-Fi systems are monitored at all times for any references to ice machines, and any mention triggers the dispatching of a containment team to the site who will attempt to identify and remove both the ice machine and the targeted individual from the premises. All ice machines discovered at locations thought to be affected by SCP-5172 are then relocated to Site-30. One final note, while SCP-5172 has long been thought to be a North American exclusive phenomenon, there has recently been one confirmed instance of an affected ice machine in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Making it even stranger is the fact that the Dutch do not seem to have the same mass public perception of the prevalence of hotel ice machines that North Americans do. And it is still unclear if this was a single isolated event or a sign that the Keter-class anomaly is spreading to other locations. Only time will tell. But in the meantime, even if you're staying outside of North America and want a frosty drink, consider paying the outrageous fees and grabbing an already cold one from the minibar. If you don't, you might find that you're paying for your refreshing beverage with much more than a pound of flesh. A young woman steps onto her bathroom scale. She holds her breath and squeezes her eyes shut, afraid to see the results as she listens to the dial spinning. When it slows to a stop, she opens her eyes and looks down. She balks at the result. 150 pounds? That's unacceptable in her eyes. She steps off the scale and examines her reflection in the full-length mirror. In truth, her weight is far from out of control, but when she looks at herself, she can't help but see flaws. The subtle ring of pudge around her middle, the way her butt sticks out just a little too far for her liking, the very faint thickness around her cheeks and chin that hint at her history of snacking. As she leaves the bathroom, she reflects on her situation. Of course she's gaining weight. How could it be any other way? For the last two years, she's been in lockdown during a pandemic, and she's barely left her apartment. She let her gym membership lapse, and instead of cycling to work, she's instead taking the easy way out by just driving and it's not like she gets much exercise in her free time either. During these last two years of isolation, she's mostly stayed in and watched television. She's discovered a particular love for trashy daytime talk shows and court dramas. Intellectually, she knows that they're the equivalent of junk food, but at the same time, there is a certain mindless charm to them. She would be embarrassed to admit it to any of her friends, but she does enjoy just turning off her brain and absorbing some silly talk show about professional stunt dwarves or Satan-worshipping furry juggalos. That sort of entertainment has been a boon to get her through the tough times. Nevertheless, it's time to make a change. She promises herself that she's going to get into shape. Today, instead of vegging out on the couch, she's going to make an effort. She's going to go out and get some exercise and, she tells herself, she's going to watch those extra pounds melt away right before her eyes. She hopes that her old gym clothes will still fit her. After all, she's definitely put on some extra weight since her last trip to the gym. After rummaging through her drawers, she finds what she's looking for her spandex gym shorts and sports bra. She quickly changes her clothes and is relieved to see that, although they might be a little snugger than she would like, they still fit her pretty well. That's a good sign. She probably won't even have to work very hard to get herself down to her ideal weight. It's all a matter of willpower, she tells herself. I was fit before, so that means I should be able to do it again. All I have to do is avoid temptation. I'll just have to make sure I stay active instead of watching trash TV all day. After all, I don't want to rot my brain too much. On the first day, she actually does an admirable job of sticking to her plan. She cycles to work, enjoying the fresh air and the reassuring post-workout burn in her legs that let her know that she's making progress. She throws away all the junk food in her refrigerator and goes shopping for healthy fruits and vegetables. And, most important of all, she limits her television time. She knows that trashy TV is probably her biggest addiction, even more than junk food, so she needs to be careful of that. On the second day, though, she notices something strange. She starts off with a simple, healthy breakfast, just some granola and a glass of juice. It's barely enough to satisfy her, but she knows that she has to make sacrifices if she expects to actually lose any weight. After breakfast, she decides to go out for a jog. As she's out on the street, she's overcome with sudden hunger. Of course, that's to be expected. She's on a diet now, so it's going to take some time to adjust to these smaller meals. She puts her hand to her rumbling stomach and grimaces. She's never felt this hungry before. If she didn't know better, she would think that she hadn't eaten for a week with the amount of pain that she's feeling. In fact, she's actually starting to feel a little woozy, and she has to lean against a light post to keep from fainting. 
She shakes her head to clear her thoughts. Okay, she thinks. I must have misjudged how many calories I need to get me through a morning. Her eyes stray to a nearby coffee shop. She sighs in relief. She thinks to herself, I'll just pop in there and get myself a small snack, just a little something to keep my blood sugar up. She walks into the cafe and gets in line. As she waits, she can't help but stare at the rows of pastries on display under the glass. They all look delicious, and she is really hungry. She fully intends to only get a bagel with a little smear of cream cheese, but when she gets to the counter, she finds herself ordering way too much food. I'd like two scones, three danishes, and a bear claw, she says. Also a large super raspberry frappuccino with extra syrup and whipped cream. The words just tumble out of her mouth almost as if it's not her saying them, but rather some other voice speaking through her mouth. What the… I didn't say that, she stammers. The clerk behind the counter eyes her strangely, and the young woman feels too embarrassed to protest further. She steps aside and waits for her order, pondering the strange event that just happened. Is she possessed? She's not a superstitious person. But she can't think of any other explanation for what just happened. She can admit to herself that she has broken down and lost to temptation over a tasty snack in the past, but this? This is ridiculous. Eventually, when the clerk hands her the order, she rationalizes the whole thing away. I must just be having a hunger hallucination, she says to herself. Obviously, I need to be a little more careful about not being so strict about my diet. I'm sure if I just eat sensibly, I won't have an experience like that again. Her stomach grumbles again, reminding her of the original reason why she stepped into this coffee shop. She retreats to a table in the corner and tears open the bag. She wolfs down her pastries with gusto and slurps at her rich, creamy drink. When she's finished, she sighs in satisfaction, although the uncomfortable, full feeling in her belly reminds her of her predicament. She only meant to eat enough to keep her from fainting, but instead, she's eating herself silly, and it's only day two of the diet. This does not bode well. Okay, she tells herself. This is my last cheat. From now on, I'm going to be serious about this diet. She stands up and leaves the cafe, ready to complete the rest of her jog. But then, something even stranger happens. On the television, the matriarch of the family is furious. She has forbidden her daughter from marrying the gardener because she believes that he is too low class for her high-born daughter. But what she doesn't realize is that her daughter is in love and that she is determined to make it work. The daughter and the gardener have eloped, and the matriarch is hiring a private detective to track them down. Meanwhile, the matriarch's long-lost twin brother, whom she thought died in a plane crash in the tropics, has actually been alive the entire time. He has been in a South American hospital recovering from amnesia, but now he returns to the family estate, ready to claim his share of the inheritance. These events are all noted by the family's shady lawyer, who has big plans to usurp the family fortune himself. Unbeknownst to the family, he is actually secretly working for their mortal enemies and business rivals to destroy them. The young woman laughs, shoving a handful of potato chips into her mouth. Oh man, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes now. That lawyer is playing them all like fiddles. Suddenly, she startles, as if she's just waking up. Where is she? Wasn't she just in that coffee shop? How is it that she's at home? And why is she eating potato chips? She was sure that she threw out all the junk food in the house. She must have bought a bag on her way back home from jogging, but she literally cannot remember it. And what is she doing now? Watching television and eating junk food? In disgust, she grabs the remote and shuts off the TV. She was supposed to be jogging, and instead, she's sitting at home and watching stupid soap operas. The thing that worries her the most is her apparent blackout. She remembers nothing about her trip home from the coffee shop, although the evidence of the potato chip bag indicates that she must have stopped at a convenience store or supermarket on the way home. How could she forget something like that? I really must be having a blood sugar issue, she tells herself reassuringly, even though deep down, she knows that can't be the case. She had the blackout after eating the pastries at the coffee shop, so that can't be the cause. But she really doesn't want to think about that, so she puts it out of her head with a renewed promise to commit to her exercise and fitness program. Over the next few days, she makes a valiant effort to keep her promise. She cycles when she can, she jogs when she remembers, and yet, the blackouts continue. And no matter where she is when she loses her memory, she always recovers in the same place. Back home on her couch, always in the middle of eating some fatty junk food, always staring at the television set. Sure, she's always had an unhealthy television habit, and she knows that trashy talk shows and silly soap operas are her biggest weakness, but it doesn't make any sense that she would be seeking them out when she's in some kind of fugue state, right? As the weeks roll by, the young woman finds that her weight keeps rising. When she steps onto the bathroom scale, she's shocked to see that the dial points to 200 pounds. She's doing everything right, she thinks. How is that possible? How is it possible that she's ballooned up an extra 50 pounds since deciding to slim down? 
She can't fit into her old gym clothes anymore. She can barely tug the spandex shorts up to her thighs and, even if she could, she's afraid that they're going to split apart. In desperation, she switches to an old stretchy sweatsuit. It's the only thing that she owns that still fits her. This is just a temporary setback, she tells herself as she stares at her bloated reflection in the bathroom mirror. I just have to work harder. And she does. Or does she? When she goes to ride her bike, she finds that it's no longer strong enough to support her weight. She can't perch on the seat comfortably and the steel body frame starts to creak when she rests her full weight upon it. She steals her resolve. Sure, it might be embarrassing to go out in public wearing an ill-fitting sweatsuit and riding a bike groaning under her bulk, but she really has no choice. This time, she's going to do it. And she probably did ride her bike to work, right? She's not sure. The next thing that she knows, she's back at home, spread across the couch, basking in the comforting glow of the television. The floor is covered in empty bags and cartons, and her face is slathered with crumbs and sauce. The last thing that she remembers is that she was just about to go for a bike ride, but now she's back at home, and it looks like she just completely ruined her diet. She lifts her arm with some effort and stares at her watch. She's lost almost a whole day. That's the longest blackout yet. She must have gone out cycling and made her way home where she decided to reward herself for her strenuous efforts with a little snack. That's the only logical explanation. She tries to reassure herself that maybe she's past the worst of it, but she finds that these mysterious blackouts keep happening. They happen while she's at work, while she's at the gym, while she's out cycling, but she always comes to in the same place, sitting on her sofa at home, in front of the TV, surrounded by the debris of a massive meal. Again, she wonders if maybe she's having some sort of reaction to her new low-calorie diet. Maybe she's been cutting back so far on her food intake that she's starting to have fainting spells. Maybe her diet food is tainted in some way. But that doesn't explain why she keeps gaining weight. The scale in her bathroom doesn't lie. It keeps reporting higher and higher numbers. And as much as she tries to reassure herself that it must just be broken, her ever-tightening clothes and ever-widening reflection tell her otherwise. Her trips to the gym become less and less frequent as she finds that other patrons have started to stare and whisper about her. Are they laughing at her for not being able to control her weight? Are they whispering about how her new flab is spilling from the confines of her sweatsuit? She can't even run on the treadmill for more than a few minutes without being completely winded, and she's too wide to balance on her bike now. The young woman has grown absolutely massive, to the point that she completely fills the whole couch. She chews her way through yet another bag of potato chips, her eyes never straying from the ever-chattering television set. She barely moves from this spot, her tremendous girth sinking into a permanent groove in the cushions as the couch springs groan. She barely notices, however, because she's much too intent on enjoying herself. She loves to eat, and every bite brings her untold joy, her taste buds tingling with delight. She is constantly full, so much so that she feels slightly sick, so bloated that she feels like she might just burst, but she's powerless to resist the siren call of junk food. She scarfs down entire boxes of cookies and cartons of ice cream without a thought, having turned into the very definition of a mindless eater. Only occasionally does she rouse herself from this stupor of gorging, to reach for her telephone, to order more takeout or more grocery delivery, always choosing the most calorie-laden options. Other than eating, her attention is completely devoted to her television set. She watches a constant stream of daytime talk shows, laughing along with the studio audience as the hosts parade out an assortment of society's biggest freaks. Sometimes she'll switch the channel to watch soap operas, becoming so wrapped up in the ridiculous plot twists and melodramatic acting that she completely forgets the passage of time. Her bicycle stands propped against the wall in the hallway, completely forgotten and untouched now for months. At this point, all thoughts of losing weight have utterly evaporated, and all that she cares about is satisfying her appetites for junk food and junk television. One day, she suddenly shakes her head and looks down at herself in horror, as if seeing herself for the first time. What the? She says in disbelief. She drops her half-eaten carton of ice cream and grabs at her fleshy middle with her hands, as if to make sure that it's all her and not some kind of crazy dream. Her hands sink deep into her new flesh, and she realizes to her shock that indeed she has eaten herself into morbid obesity. How is this possible? I can't be this big. I was only… only… Her words trail off as a sound of an organ sting from the soap opera on TV diverts her attention. Within seconds, her eyes have glazed over and her hands move to pick up the dropped carton of ice cream. Her worries about her growing size forgotten, she's now only concerned with watching until the next commercial break. It might seem unbelievable that someone could undergo such a startling physical and mental transformation, but what that young woman experienced has led to her being classified by the Foundation as SCP-2611. SCP-2611 is, as you might have expected, 
a young woman currently weighing approximately 500 pounds. Her mobility is limited due to her weight, although SCP staff encourage her to take light exercise whenever possible, in hopes of preventing her mobility from deteriorating further. She also suffers from several health issues related to her weight and lifestyle, including diabetes, for which she is receiving treatment by Foundation personnel. Her awareness of her situation and surroundings is severely limited, as she spends most of her time in a stupor, but when she is lucid, she believes that she is in a special facility receiving treatment for her weight problem. In reality, SCP-2611 is under observation because of SCP-2611-1. SCP-2611-1 is a mass of sentient fat located on SCP-2611's left side. SCP-2611-1 has become integrated with several of SCP-2611's vital organs, making it too dangerous to attempt to remove SCP-2611-1 via liposuction or other means. SCP-2611-1 has gradually exerted increasing control over the mind and actions of its host, to the point that SCP-2611 is only fully conscious for one to two hours daily. The rest of the time, SCP-2611-1 is fully in control of its host's behavior. Prior to coming to the SCP facility, SCP-2611-1 influenced its host to consume massive amounts of calories, leading to the mysterious and sudden weight gain that we observed earlier. This was possibly an attempt by SCP-2611-1 to increase its own size and influence, but as of yet, its reasons, as well as how it exerts control over its host, are unknown. When in control, SCP-2611-1 can speak through its host, communicating in standard American English. SCP-2611's access to food has been limited since her arrival at the Foundation, so as to prevent her weight gain from accelerating to dangerous levels. Other than eating, SCP-2611-1's main interest appears to be daytime television. Attempts to communicate with SCP-2611-1 have so far met with little success due to the anomaly's limited attention span for anything other than the minutiae of daytime television. In a conversation with one researcher, however, SCP-2611-1 let slip that it preferred daytime television to the programming watched by, quote, that other guy, suggesting that it lived inside a different host before it eventually took up residence within the body of SCP-2611. At another point, while in the middle of a conversation about a court drama, SCP-2611-1 suddenly announced, Kill it! Kill it now! I don't care if I die! Staff believe that this might not have been SCP-2611-1 at all, but rather the voice of SCP-2611 trying to break through the hypnotic control of her parasite to call for help. At this time, no drastic action is recommended until further observations can be made. SCP-2611-1 does not appear to be contagious, and the way that it bonds with the host is unknown, so it is currently classified as safe. At the moment, SCP-2611-1 is the only known instance of its kind. However, considering rising levels of obesity worldwide, it is not unfathomable to think that there could be countless other instances influencing the behavior of other hosts to dedicate their lives to consuming food and television. Who knows, it's not like most of us would need that much convincing. It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk, and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. 
He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend, says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with the telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. <laughs> it's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking, but somehow this hangover feels different. He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange, too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch, and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. He should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches, and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged, claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school, when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now, he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. 
His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big, ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody, and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. That's good, thinks the derelict. It will give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him. His hair and fingernails keep growing to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin, but he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? They might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much, carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. The landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. 
SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy, as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate but a 21% fatality rate. From phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2 but will not stop it entirely. In stage 2, beginning 1 to 2 weeks after stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In stage 3, beginning 3 to 6 weeks after stage 2, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. Hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3 to 7 days after stage 3, the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In stage 5, beginning 1 to 2 days after stage 4, the skin begins to move in patterns indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into stage 6. 
Little information about Stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at Stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm, perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street, though personally, I think that's just common sense. You and your friends exit a club and step onto the darkened city street. Everyone is in a happy and joyful mood. It's been a great night, one that you'll be reminiscing about with your friends for years. As you walk and laugh together, you don't notice the large man standing in front of you and almost run straight into him. You offer a quick apology and move to go around the man, but he steps in front of you, blocking your path. All of your friends grow quiet and you finally take a good look at the man. The man towers over you. He is huge, with giant elaborate tattoos wrapped around his bulging muscles that it looks like he may have gotten to cover up the numerous white patches of skin that are missing pigmentation. His face, though, is bright red and filled with rage. The man begins screaming at you, asking why you ran into him and calling you horrible names. Again, you try to apologize, but the man just keeps yelling as if he can't even hear you. He pushes you hard in the chest, and you fall back into one of your friends. Another steps forward in an attempt to defuse the situation, but the man punches him in the face, breaking his jaw. A melee ensues, though it could more accurately be described as a massacre. The man has gone ballistic and punches, kicks, and bites your entire group of friends. His strength seems unreal, even for someone as big and muscular as him. A large bouncer runs over in an attempt to break up the fight, but even he is no match for this tattooed giant. You've been on the ground since he shoved you, watching this insanity play out, but now with everyone else lying on the ground bloodied and bruised, he turns his attention back on you. You try to scramble back to your feet, but he's upon you in an instant. He picks you up over his head and tosses you into some trash cans, knocking you unconscious. You open your eyes to see the man standing over you. You can feel the blood from numerous cuts on your face running down into your eyes and mouth. The man picks you up with one hand and holds you by the throat against the wall. He's still in a rage, breathing hard through clenched teeth, bits of white foaming in the corners of his mouth as he brings up his other hand and curls his fingers into a fist. All you can think is, is this it? But then you notice something. The tattoo that snakes down the man's arm all the way to his hand is moving. The long serpentine dragon is writhing and slithering as if it's alive. Is this really happening or just a result of the concussive trauma you've received? There's no time to consider it further, though, as the man pulls back and throws a punch right into your face. You can feel your nose flatten and break from the impact, which understandably distracts you from the bizarre occurrence that follows. Right as the man's bloodied fist makes contact with your face, the dragon on his arm seems to swim off of his skin and onto yours. Like a snake moving through water, it glides off his fist onto your face before sliding down your neck onto your body. There is a searing pain as it moves, like you're being poked with needles over and over. You scream from the pain, blood from your broken nose pouring out of your mouth. The man drops you to the ground and steps back. He no longer looks to be in a rage and instead looks confused. He looks down at his skin to find that the tattoo is completely gone. 
A look of unbridled joy comes over his face, and he turns and runs away into the night, laughing with glee as he does so. You are left whimpering in pain, curled up in a ball in the pile of trash where he left you, the dragon tattoo now covering your entire body. As you have probably already guessed, this is no normal tattoo. No, this is an anomalous creature that is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-021, but it also has another name, the Skin Worm. SCP-021 is an obligate parasite that uses the human body as a host. Its visual appearance is in the form of a large, elaborate tattoo of an oriental-style dragon, which covers roughly one square meter of its host's skin. What makes this tattoo truly unique is that it is fully animated and moves on the host's body just as a real animal would, though in 2D like a cartoon playing out in real time on their skin. The movement of the tattoo causes horrendous pain for the host, and has been described as feeling like thousands of tiny needles are stabbing at them all at once, as if a fresh image is being constantly tattooed on their skin, while at the same time, a tattoo removal process is happening. While the tattoo organism is able to move, it seems to prefer spending most of its time on its host's torso, though it has been seen to move around to other parts of the body on occasion. As SCP-021 moves around on the surface of its host's body, it appears to feed on the pigments in the skin. Its favored meal seems to be other tattoos, which it will seek out and devour, though if none are present, or if it has eaten all of the tattoos on its host, it will begin consuming the melanin from the skin instead. Melanin is a naturally occurring pigment found in human skin, and after SCP-021 sucks it from its host, it will leave them with permanent skin damage and patches of unpigmented skin that appear similar to that of the skin condition vitiligo. The feeding itself does not appear to cause the host any pain, and the pigments, whether they are from another tattoo or the natural ones in the skin, will simply disappear as 021 eats them. The pace at which SCP-021 feeds will vary, but it has been observed as being able to clear over half a square meter of skin in roughly one hour. One way to prevent SCP-021 from eating all of the melanin present on a human is to quickly add new tattoos of fruits or small animals as a way to continually distract it from turning to the melanin. Thus far, outside of motion, the organism has displayed no elevated intelligence or the ability to communicate. It simply moves and feeds. SCP-021 is not permanently affixed to the skin of any one host, and in fact, can be transferred back and forth between hosts multiple times. The only way to transfer the organism is through physical contact, though skin-to-skin -skin contact does not guarantee that the organism will take to a new host. In the event that it does, the dragon tattoo appears to swim across the touching skin and will affix itself to the new human host. Skin-to-skin -skin contact in the, um, romantic sense has been shown to be the most reliable method of transfer from one host to another with a 93% rate of successful transmission. However, as you can imagine, the tattooing sensation that comes along with any movement of SCP-021 means that this particular transfer is extremely painful for all parties involved, and the Foundation has deemed that despite its high success rate, it should only be used when absolutely necessary. Contact between two open wounds has been shown to be an only slightly less effective method, and has become the default means of transferring when the SCP Foundation wants to move SCP-021 from one host to another. Transferring the organism from a deceased host to a living one is possible, though more complicated. SCP-021 appears not to mind when its host organism is no longer alive, continuing to feed on whatever pigments are available to it, and does not seem to suffer any ill effect from the condition of its host. It is as yet unknown whether SCP-021 could be transferred to another species. So far, the organism has only been willing to move from human to human, though research into the question is ongoing. It's theorized that if SCP-021 is able to exist on a non-human animal, it would only occur in the rarest of circumstances. Unlike most parasites, SCP-021 does offer some small but tangible benefits to its host human. In addition to hosts of the organism appearing to have an improved immune system, research has also shown that the presence of 021 will increase its host's release and reuptake of epinephrine, better known as adrenaline. It will also decrease the buildup of lactic acid, which is what builds up in the muscles during activity and causes burning sensations and soreness. 
Combined, these benefits from SCP-021 provide its host with increased strength and confidence, as well as give a heightened pain tolerance during stressful situations. Not surprisingly, the host of SCP-021 also displays a high level of aggression, though whether this comes from their elevated hormone levels or simply because the organism causes them to be in constant pain is still an unanswered question. The amount of time that this symbiotic relationship can be sustained is typically limited to how long the host can tolerate the unceasing pain of the tattoo moving about their body. The persistent agony that a host of SCP-021 endures has led to multiple hosts having taken their own lives, and in a few rare cases, they have also succumbed to fatal skin infections. Though these were likely the result of open wounds caused by the hosts scratching at their own skin, rather than anything directly attributable to the organism. SCP-021 is currently contained on the body of a D-Class personnel, D-139, who is housed in Standard Detention Cell 217A, and the relative ease with which it can be kept on a human subject's body has led to it receiving the safe classification. Only D-Class personnel are eligible to be a host to SCP-021, and current operating procedure is to allow the organism to live on the same host's body until they expire. The exact nature of what SCP-021 is, as well as its origins, remain a mystery to the Foundation. Attempts have been made to trace the path of its transmission from before its time in containment, and it is hypothesized that the organism could be many hundreds of years old, if not older. As evidenced by its low SCP number, 021 is one of the oldest SCPs that the Foundation keeps contained, and it has proven to be a very useful educational tool for new and upcoming researchers as they study this bizarre creature and its existence that occurs entirely within two dimensions. A young man steps off the subway into the station. Like many others on their daily commute, he has headphones on and keeps his eyes glued to his phone as he messages his friends, plays mobile games, and watches videos. He takes the escalator up and out of the subway station, paying no mind to the rats that scurry past down the handrail. He steps out onto the street, head still never looking up from his phone. He's made the same trip hundreds, if not thousands of times, each step of his route home so burned into his mind that he could make this journey blindfolded. He turns a corner when, suddenly, he looks up. There's something different. In the split second before everything goes wrong, he realizes what it is. The grate he has stepped onto has just given way. The young man screams as he falls through the loose drainage grate in the sidewalk and is swallowed up into the bowels of the city. He is in the air for only moments before landing with a thud in the darkness below. The air is knocked out of him, but he's immediately aware that he didn't hit the ground as hard as he could have. Something must have broken his fall. It's too dark to see anything, though. He feels around for his phone. It must be around here somewhere. There, he's got it. The screen is cracked, but luckily, it still works. He turns on the flashlight and looks around. He appears to be in some kind of maintenance area below the sidewalk. The room is mostly empty. So what did he land on? He sits up and looks beneath him to find… rats. A huge pile of rats. The young man screams and hops up as the rats squeak and scatter. He's in a panic, looking for a way to get out of here as quickly as possible, when he spots something else. There's a pile of dirty clothes in the corner of the room, or at least, he hopes it's a pile of dirty clothes. He slowly steps towards whatever it is. Even after his own harrowing ordeal, he still feels compelled to check it out. If he just found a body, the police will need to know, and he might even get his name in the paper. He can see the headline now. Local man finds missing heiress after heroically plunging into city's depths, inherits her millions for some reason. As he steps closer, he notices a cloud of gnats and flies buzzing around the pile. He slaps at his neck, killing some kind of biting fly. He's standing right next to the pile, but he still can't tell if this is a person or not. Hello? Are you okay? The young man asks. No response. He nudges the pile with his foot and jumps back. Did he feel something move? He sticks out his foot and nudges it again. The pile definitely moves this time. A man rolls over, his face covered in bug bites. He's moaning and reaching out, unable to see from his blind eyes that look like they have been gnawed out by rats. He opens his mouth and with one last gasp, appears to die right in front of the young man. The young man can only watch, frozen in fear, as a rat wriggles its way out of his open mouth and stares at the young man. The young man screams, turns, and runs. He doesn't know where he's going as he runs through the dark tunnels, but he finds a set of stairs and follows them up before bursting out of a door into the open air. 
He slams the door behind him. He's sure the man he saw in the tunnels died, but he's not taking any chances. He runs the rest of the way home, taking the stairs up to his apartment two at a time. He gets into his home and locks and bolts the door behind him. He leans against the door and tries to catch his breath, letting himself slide down to the floor. Finally, safe at last. He slaps at his neck again. Another fly. It must have been in his coat. He takes off his jacket and shirt, shaking them out, and is surprised to see more flies come out, but also other bugs like worms and cockroaches. He keeps shaking, panicking now, as more and more bugs fall from his clothes. He can see in the mirror on the wall that his body is covered in bites, but that's not what really has his attention. He gets close to the mirror, almost in a daze. This can't be right. He must be hallucinating. He looks in the mirror, reaches into his nose, and pulls out a cockroach. Flies crawl out of his mouth as he opens his mouth to scream, while behind him, rats start squeezing in under his door and crawling up his body until he is completely covered in a living, writhing mass of vermin. Many of the anomalies studied by the SCP Foundation are cruel, horrific, and utterly mysterious. And this is one of the rare cases that embodies all three. Because this is SCP-027, also known as the Vermin God. SCP-027 is a phenomenon with strange and frightening properties that seems to affect one human subject at a time. When someone becomes a host to this anomaly, they will find that they are constantly surrounded by swarms of various types of vermin, parasites, and other pests. The human host has no ability to control or command these creatures, and in fact, the animals will often show aggression towards the host, biting and scratching at them as well as any other person who comes near. It is unknown what causes this effect, but once someone has become a host to SCP-027, the effect appears to be permanent. The swarms of vermin that follow the host do not appear instantly, and instead, tend to follow the same pattern of showing up in waves. First, swarms of flying insects, including gnats and flies, will begin to form a cloud around the unlucky individual. Next, non-flying creatures such as lice, cockroaches, worms, spiders, and rats will begin to crawl on the host. The more time that passes, the more of all of these that will appear. Should the host try to leave the location, some of the pests will attempt to cling to them or follow behind, but many of the others will disperse. As soon as the host stops again, though, the process will repeat, and they will once again soon be surrounded by bugs and rodents. While there is no way for a host to rid themselves of the SCP-027 anomaly, the phenomenon has been known to be transferred to a new host, but only following the death of the first. It appears that 027 will continue to jump from host to host, and has likely done this many times in the past. Preliminary research into just how long SCP-027 has existed is ongoing, but early signs point to it having existed for potentially hundreds of years. SCP-027 was first identified by the Foundation when, in the 1990s, a male in his late 30s was found in an abandoned warehouse that was completely overrun with rats and insects. The man was filthy, malnourished, and covered in bites and scratches from a variety of pests. He also showed symptoms of deteriorating mental health, likely caused by a combination of heavy substance abuse and sleep deprivation, neither of which were unexpected, given his horrendous circumstances. The anomalous properties of the subject were quickly recognized by field agents, and he was brought to an SCP Foundation site, where he unfortunately died while still under observation. An autopsy later revealed that over 70% of the man's body at the time of death consisted of a colony of rats that had nested in his abdomen and had been living there long enough to produce at least several generations of offspring. Around six days after the man's death, a Foundation security officer at the site where the man had been held reported to medical staff that he was experiencing breathing issues. He told them they began after he had been woken up by what he thought was a housefly crawling up his nose, and he did remember the fly coming back out. Later investigations would reveal that this statement was true and that the fly laid a clutch of eggs in his sinus cavity as well. The security officer was placed under observation, and following the appearance of more types of vermin, he was classified as SCP-02702. The man who died was then reclassified as SCP-02701, and SCP-027 was redefined as an anomalous effect rather than one individual. It is still unknown just how SCP-027 attracts animals or why it chooses the ones it does to summon to its location. 
Neither SCP-02701 or 02 have expressed any communication with any kind of entity or the feeling that one was present, and were unable to provide any additional information on the mysterious qualities of the anomaly. In an interview that took place not long after the security officer was identified as a host and placed into containment, he only described feeling dirty and itchy, like he needed a shower. He was deeply frightened by what was happening, and expressed the desire to rid himself of the anomalous effect as soon as possible so that he could rejoin his family. Research into the anomaly continues, but analysis of the current host has been inconclusive at best. The lack of understanding about just what SCP-027 is, how its anomalous effect functions, and how it jumps to a new host, has led the SCP Foundation to classify it as Euclid. The current host for the anomaly is being held in a 5 by 5 meter cell, with a raised, graded floor that is connected to a strong vacuum system, to trap any vermin that appear. Any creatures that are removed from the cell are to be incinerated, except for a small portion which are sent to research teams for analysis, though so far, all animals have appeared to be completely non-anomalous in nature. SCP-02702 is to be monitored by at least two Foundation personnel at all times, and in the event that the subject exhibits any odd behavior or an unexpected species of animal is discovered in the cell, it is to be reported to a Level 4 personnel immediately. Security personnel assigned to 027 duty are to be vaccinated against all possible animal-borne diseases and have permission to subdue the subject with tranquilizers should the need arise. Should the subject appear to be experiencing a serious medical event, all high-value personnel should be moved far away from the current host to lower the chance of them becoming a host to the anomaly. And no personnel of Level 4 clearance or higher should approach within 200 meters of the subject at all, until SCP-027 and its strange properties are better understood. London's never really quiet. Even in the dead of night, there are still taxis driving, drunks shouting, and arguments echoing from top floor windows. Cleaners and airport staff trudge through the darkened streets on their way to work, not looking up at the bar staff and security guards plodding home. It's probably better that it never gets really quiet though, as much as the thief would like to be able to hear the footsteps of someone else coming his way, it's probably best that the noises out on the street mask his own. His theory is proven correct almost immediately as he jumps from the overpass down onto the construction site. He makes it over the barbed wire fence, but loses his footing on the landing and falls against a porta potty. The plastic wall splits and he clatters through into the toilet. Sticking out a hand, he manages to stop himself. You'll never guess where his hand landed. Ah, wonderful. For a moment, he slumps there, grumbling to himself, praying no one hurt him. But outside, there's just the regular hum of London's nightlife. He's safe for now. He straightens up, opens the door of the porta potty, and steps out. He has to crane his neck back to look up at the structure in front of him. He's at the base of a block of flats, or at least what would have been a block of flats. He'd asked the chicken shop owner from across the street about this place earlier in the day. The man told him it was supposed to be a new development to attract young 20-something professionals to the area, but midway through construction, the company shut down. Now the shell of the building stands empty, waiting to be knocked back down. With any luck, there might still be some building equipment around here that he can salvage, or maybe a bit of copper wiring he can sell. At the very least, it'll put a roof over his head for a few nights. He's even got a toilet. Kind of. He'll scope the place out and call his wife in a bit. After a long day working the market stalls, she deserves her night in the soup kitchen tonight. That place had stopped letting him in after the last fight. The pair of them aren't exactly homeless. They just don't have a home right now. The thief sidles into the building, peering around in the gloom. Exposed concrete and girders surround him in every direction. There aren't many walls in place yet, just floors and ceiling, broken up by staircases and supporting pillars. It'll be quite exposed down here. He needs to head up higher to see if there are any more secluded spots for the night. As he climbs up the stairs, the thief hears voices above him echoing through the empty shell of a building. He peeks over the top of the stairs. This floor is a bit more divided up. There are a few walls in place. He sees the light of what must be a fire dancing around the edge of one of them. That's where the voices are coming from. Security guards wouldn't light a fire. They must be homeless. Ugh, the thief hates homeless people. Being surrounded by them so much at the moment is just demeaning. They have no morals, no standards, they just lie and steal. He spies a couple of backpacks leaning against the wall. He'll have to be quiet, but with a bit of luck, he can sneak over and take one of those packs without any of them hearing. He creeps up to the top of the stairs, and a piece of metal glints at him in the dark. 
a sledgehammer, lying there on the ground. He tiptoes over to it and lifts it into his arms. It's heavy. If he can give it a good swing, it'll keep him safe for sure. He grins and makes his way towards the packs on the ground. He gently loops a hand under the shoulder strap. Three, two, one. Clatter! An empty can falls out of the side and bounces off the concrete floor. What was that? Oh, no. The thief shoulders the pack and runs, but it's too late. A pair of hands grab him and spin him around. The thief staggers backward but stays on his feet. Three figures surround him in the dark. He doesn't have a choice. He swings the sledgehammer wildly. It takes all of his strength just to lift it, but sure enough, he feels it connect. He swings it back the other way, hard as he can. His arms strain from the effort. A man yelps in the darkness. Something heavy thuds to the floor. For a moment, all four of them stand there in silence. The thief holds the sledgehammer at the ready. He isn't sure if he's got the strength to swing it again, even with all this adrenaline. But the other men aren't looking at him. The two on either side stare at the man in the middle. Or rather, what used to be the man in the middle. The man's friends bolt for the exit. They run off into the night without a look back. Neither will ever be able to explain what they saw tonight. It takes a long time for the thief's hands to warm up by the fire. They feel cold and don't stop trembling for a long time. So long that the sun is about to come up. There's something red on the thief's hands. He can just about make it out in the flickering light. Must be blood. He wipes it on the ground and reaches into his pocket, fishing out the little brick phone. He's only got 5% battery left and almost no minutes on the sim. No time to explain the details. He just calls his wife, gives her the location, and tells her to come quick. She'll need to jump from the overpass soon before there are too many commuters on the rails. He's moved the body, of course. He's sitting next to it right now, actually. Couldn't leave it out in the open for anyone to see. In this little nook with the fire, he's well hidden from the outside world. There's graffiti on the walls. This must be a popular spot. If anyone comes and disturbs him, he knows what he's doing with them. The sledgehammer leans against his leg. After about an hour, he hears footsteps on the concrete behind him. He whistles once. Two whistles come back. His wife stops dead when she rounds the corner. He hadn't told her what had happened over the phone, just that he'd found them a new spot. She's staring at the body lying next to him. Rose petals and candles usually work better. He shrugs and looks back at the flames. Not his fault. Self-defense, as always. But she doesn't stop staring. It's starting to annoy him now. It's like she's never seen a body. What's wrong with her? Can't she? Then he hears it. Soft, rasping breathing. Very slowly, the thief turns his head. Lying there on the ground next to him, with half of his head caved in, the man is still alive, staring at them both through one horrified eye. The thief grasps the sledgehammer and stands up. That just makes no sense. His wife looks puzzled too. They look at the man lying on the ground in more detail. A chunk of his head is missing completely, but the wound underneath is healed over. The flesh and brain underneath looks like it's been cauterized, as if he'd been burned. And surely you can't still be alive with that big of a chunk of your brain missing. Strange, his wife mumbles. Her hand joins his on the hilt of the sledgehammer. She takes it from him and caves in the homeless man's head. In just a few swings, his head is a red, mushy pulp on the floor. Definitely dead now. They both stare at the body for a bit. No more breathing. Lovely. Problem solved. But the red mush doesn't look like blood. Incredulously, his wife extends a finger and dips it into the red mush on the homeless man's head. She raises it to her mouth and has a taste. Salsa. 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 He doesn't believe her. He leans down to take a nibble of the red mush on the ground. Sure enough, the cool taste of pico de gallo meets his tongue. It's not bad, you know. Ignoring the sweaty grime of the homeless man's flesh, it's actually pretty good. The thief looks over at his wife. She scoops two fingers through the goop and sticks it in her mouth. A grin spreads across her face, a glint lighting up her eye. He's been married to her long enough to know what this face means. She's got a plan. Finding the jars proves to be the biggest issue, or at least finding intact jars. Dumpster diving has never been the thief's favorite pastime. Feels a bit too homeless for him. But as he climbs out of his 12th bin of the day with nothing to show for his efforts but a measly little glass jar, he thinks he's had enough. He tosses a rotten potato at his wife. It splatters in her hair. It would probably stink anywhere, but amongst all this trash, the potato is probably the best-smelling thing around. You throw one more bit of trash at me, 
and I'll be dipping tortillas in what's left of you, she says. The thief's had enough. He clamors out of the dumpster and storms over to his wife. This plan sucks. Why does he have to be the one covered in trash all the time? Why is he the one always breaking into construction sites? He raises a fist above his head, just as she spots the jar in his hand and squeals in excitement. She pecks him on the lips and excitedly tells him that they should have enough of them now to get started. Her lips taste of rotten potato. Back in the construction site, they get to work. Taking it in turns, they raise the sledgehammer above their heads and bring it down on the homeless man's body. With every hit, they expect the magic to stop working, but it doesn't. Dollops of salsa pool where bruises would normally form. While one of them pummels the corpse, the other scoops the salsa into jars, carefully screwing on the lid and writing little labels to go alongside. Artisanal pico de gallo, three pound fifty. Salsa made straight from the heart. It's not all made from a heart though, is it? The thief says. Only one jar will be. The rest will be made from the bowels and stuff. It's all connected, in it? You can taste some in a bit and tell me if any of it's different. He doesn't really fancy trying bowel salsa, but his wife makes him. She's the one holding the hammer. You know what? If he didn't know it was bowel salsa, he never would have guessed it. Tastes pretty much the same as all the rest. The pair of them manage to mash about half of the body into salsa that day. The remaining carcass lies on the concrete rather neatly. There's no blood or gore at all. If anything, this is a pretty sterile affair. Just salsa. What we call no business, then? The thief asks. How about Joe's? His wife rolls her eyes at him and thinks for a moment. El martillo y la pulpa. The thief doesn't know any Spanish, so he just laughs and pretends he gets the joke. At least, he hopes it was a joke. Two days later, business is booming. From the first thing in the morning until late in the afternoon, the jars of salsa are selling like hotcakes. The two of them can hardly believe it. At lunchtime each day, the thief has to go back to the apartment and restock. Those are their code words for going back to the dilapidated apartment complex and pulverizing the corpse of a homeless man with a sledgehammer, just in case that wasn't clear. At £3.50 per jar, their handmade recipe is pulling in the big bucks. Who'd have guessed that the homeless could be so profitable? The market they're selling in apparently has a strong Mexican migrant community living nearby. On top of that, a handful of local moms started sharing photos of the artisan salsa from the local market, which surged the demand. It might even be time to start jacking up the prices. Only, they've got a problem. As the thief arrives at the market with a wheelbarrow full of freshly filled jars, he pulls his wife to one side to have a whispered conversation with her. They're almost out of stock. And of course, by the word stock, they really mean the cold, rotting, dead body. His wife looks at him incredulously. Does he really not see the solution here? If you're running low on ingredients and your product is flying off the shelves, what do you do? You go out and source yourself some more damn ingredients. As the thief walks away with his wheelbarrow and sledgehammer, he wonders why it's always him doing the messy jobs. But try as he might, the thief can't find any targets. He walks around all of the streets near the block of flats, but has no luck. He approaches one sleeping homeless man and kicks him in the shoulder, trying to wake him. Bad idea. The man starts yelling loud enough to attract the attention of everyone on the street. No amount of begging or bargaining is going to get this man to move an inch. The thief gives it a go anyway and watches in shock as the man buries his teeth into his ankle. Limping back up the stairs into their nook in the construction site, the thief has a scowl on his face. After a couple of hours, his wife arrives and joins him at the fire. It's a good profit today, even better than the previous day. Keep this up and they'll be rich in no time. He grins at his wife. She leers back, then shoves the money back into her pocket. Hang on a minute. That wasn't part of the deal. They're partners, 50-50. She bares her teeth at him and tells him she's just holding on to it for now. The sledgehammer sits halfway between them. The thief glances down at it. So does his wife. But that night, they are in luck. A drunk wanders into the construction site. He's so wasted that he doesn't have time to figure out that he's been pummeled to death by a hammer until he's just a generous splodge of salsa fresca slowly oozing across the concrete floor. The following night, another two men saunter in. Then, the thief convinces an obnoxious local with a dog to follow him into the place the afternoon after that. The dog wasn't worth the effort. It ran around a lot before they caught it and only produced enough salsa for a medium-sized garden party. But the haul is good. All of a sudden, they are overrun with work. Jar after jar after jar. Everyone in the area keeps coming back for more, even telling their friends about it. This salsa is to die for. They have to know the recipe. Dead Londoners, drunks, dogs, that kind of thing. 
The crowd of moms aren't quite sure what the joke was, but try to laugh anyway. Everything is going perfectly. Except, of course, for the thief's ankle. The bite mark went purple, and now it's on its way to green. The veins on his foot and up his leg are starting to look like a funny color. He should really go to the hospital, but he reckons it'll be okay. Besides, they don't really like him at any of the hospitals around here. He's had one too many visits, and been the reason for one too many for several other men. But that night, it's clear that something's wrong. As he and his wife sit on the pile of corpses next to their fire, he feels a cold sweat on his brow. His wife counts all of the coins into neat piles. There's more in front of them than they've ever shared before, but his head is feeling swimmy. The thief lies down on the corpse bed. He's back to back with an investment banker who took the wrong alley home on his walk home from work. No lying down yet. You need to cook up a new batch before bed. His wife is glaring at him. He refuses, says he's too tired tonight, and his ankle hurts. She starts grumbling at him about not pulling his weight. A switch flips in his head. I'll do more work when you give me what I'm owed. The money. I want my share now. His wife cackles and jumps to her feet. Fat chance. He's not seeing a penny until he actually starts to contribute. She's the one who came up with the idea. She's the one who sells dozens of jars a day. She's the one holding the sledgehammer right now. His eyes widen. What are you doing with that? You say your ankle's sick. Well, I know something that could help you with that. Before his woozy mind can register what's happening, the sledgehammer arcs through the air towards him. That sobers him up. Lucky for him, he manages to roll out of the way at the last moment, causing the sledgehammer to embed himself in the ground next to him. That's it. It's time for a hostile divorce. He hauls himself to his feet and grasps the hammer. Pulling it as hard as he can towards himself, the metal connects with his chest and he feels the salsa running down his ribs. He shoves her back. The sledgehammer catches her shoulder and salsarizes it. Tomato chunks fly across the room and sizzle in the fire. Back and forth, back and forth the hammer swings, hitting the thief, then his wife, then him again, on and on, until nothing is left but a sledgehammer and two large piles of salsa. Usually it's the smell that alerts people to a dead body, except for once, it was actually a pretty pleasant smell. Forensic police had to consciously stop themselves from having a taste. One of them even happened to have some tortillas in the car that day. By the time he returned to the station that evening, the packet was empty. He swears to this day that he ate them dry. It wasn't long before the story broke. Some in the local press theorized that this was a bizarre viral marketing campaign from Doritos. Once that theory was out there, it wasn't long before the story died. No one likes overly aggressive advertising. To this day, Scotland Yard hasn't got a clue what was going on at that crime scene. One senior investigating officer was unofficially quoted shaking his head and saying, I don't know what the hell happened here. Sometimes it's best to just not ask questions. We all know it takes two to tango, but I bet you didn't know it takes a sledgehammer to salsa. That was my attempt to draw some kind of lesson from SCP-3794. You can probably guess the nickname of this SCP already. The Salsa Sledgehammer. Currently stored in a standard item locker, this SCP is considered to be totally safe in the right hands. You could use it to demolish walls, break apart cinder blocks, or win over your new mother-in-law with a fresh bowl of homemade nachos. Assuming, of course, that you have the necessary ingredients. That is because when SCP-3794 makes sufficiently heavy contact with living tissue, it immediately converts the point of impact and surrounding area into salsa. Affecting roughly 3 to 8 centimeters around the impact points, this salsa does not adhere to the rest of the body and will immediately slide out of its crater and fall to the ground. Peering at the hole left behind, you will see that the nerve endings, capillaries, and even main arteries will all be instantaneously sealed off. This sledgehammer would make for a very clean murder weapon if it wasn't for the human-sized amount of salsa you get everywhere in the process. You would need to ensure you smashed up every part of the body, though, as any disconnected limbs or tissues still function and follow orders from the brain as if nothing is wrong, as our thief learned only too well. The salsa itself is good. Nothing incredible, but not that bad either. It just goes to show that if you stick an artisan label on anything, then people go crazy for it. Testing on this sledgehammer has been suspended. A test subject was chosen to lie with his head over a generously sized serving bowl. Researchers swung the hammer and demolished half of the test subject's skull and brain in just one hit. Much to their surprise, however, the subject continued to exhibit all signs of consciousness, moving frantically around the room and even writing the word helped in the spilled salsa. The subject died 30 minutes later, the moment that researchers taste tested the dip. Since then, the sledgehammer has remained in its locker, 
Although there is often now an air of suspicion whenever a jar of salsa shows up in the fridge in the break room. A face screams in terrible agony. In the darkness, you can't quite make out the shape of its body, but it doesn't look human. It's large and square, almost boxy. Two things you should know. This is a fate worse than death, and it isn't the only one. It's a busy but ordinary day in Hangzhou, China. People are rushing to and from work, going to school, going for walks, buying a hot meal and a cup of tea. But for one young police officer, this is a monumental day. He has been assigned the biggest case of his career, and he grips the stack of files with sweaty, trembling hands as he considers the weight of this moment. It isn't just one case, not really. It's actually six. Six separate missing person cases that he's beginning to suspect might be connected. Our detective wishes he could take a moment and transport himself away from these harrowing missing person cases and clear his head. But while he's unable to, we can. Thanks to the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends, the hit mobile hero collection RPG played by over 80 million players across the world. And they've got some huge news for both new and returning players, the recently added Live Arena. To tell us about it, I've invited a fellow academic to join us today. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so's going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. <laughs> Teamwork! When you win matches, you'll get Live Arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. All right, class. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Bob here. What's your personal strategy for Live Arena? Well, everyone thinks I'll go in fighting, but nobody expects my charm. My best strength is the gift of gab. So when they try to attack, I'll just be like, nice weather we're having, eh? Nobody will see it coming. That doesn't sound like a very effective strategy. Do not pick me for Live Arena. Seriously, don't. I'm too young to be bone meal. Well, thank you for your- Class dismissed! Do we have a bell? Oh, we should totally get a bell. Class definitely not dismissed, but there's a bunch of brand new content in Raid Shadow Legends related to the animated limited series Call of the Arbiter, including a free legendary champion, the mighty orc warlord Artak. All you have to do to get him is log into Raid for seven days between now and July 24th. Easy. New players, use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. So just hit my link in the description, and I'll see you on the battlefield. And now, back to the case at hand. The detective was beginning to suspect that the six separate missing person cases might be connected. At first glance, they seem unrelated. The victims have very little in common, except one thing. They all worked at the same office, an office that closed one month ago, a casualty of international corporate downsizing. No one from his police department has bothered to look into this angle, assuming that it will lead back to more dead leads. But the young officer can't shake the feeling that there is important information waiting for him in that abandoned office building. So after finishing up his lunch and dabbing the nervous sweat from his brow with a handkerchief from his pocket, he sets off toward the old office building in hopes of cracking the case wide open. As he makes the trip, he considers some other possible theories. Maybe the missing employees skipped town, overwhelmed and depressed from their unexpected job loss. But would they really let their families worry like this? Some of them have wives, husbands, children, all of whom would notice their absence and assume the worst. No, this isn't a simple case of a group of colleagues all vanishing to blow off steam in another city somewhere. Something bad happened. He can just feel it. Maybe they uncovered corporate secrets and someone decided to silence them before they could blow the whistle. But then again, what sort of secrets would be worth killing for at a printer company? It feels worthless trying to guess, trying to fill in the gaps in his knowledge with wild speculation. The only way to find out was to examine the building for himself and see if he can find any clues at all that lead him to the whereabouts of the missing six. When the young officer reaches the building, he finds the door padlocked shut. Luckily, he prepared for this and brought some industrial strength bolt cutters that snapped the lock into pieces with very little effort. Why lock up the building like this? There can't be anything valuable left inside. To prevent squatters, most likely, he assures himself, brushing off the sense of dread creeping up his spine as he walks inside. 
As he crosses the threshold of the empty office, the first thing he notices is the smell. It reeks of sulfur and bleach and a whiff of something electrical that stings the inside of his nostrils with each breath. New possibilities turn over in his mind. Perhaps some sort of deadly workplace accident claimed the lives of the missing when they came back in to collect their belongings and clear out the building. Before he can decide if that theory holds any water, his thoughts are interrupted by a piercing scream coming from a nearby room. The officer isn't alone here, there's someone in the building with him, and they sound like they're in trouble. The officer grabs the taser from his holster and runs toward the sound. He skids to a stop, nearly knocking over a water cooler when he reaches the source of the screaming. There's a man hanging from the wall, screaming over and over again. The officer can barely process what he's seeing. The man is covered in machinery, all whirring and clicking as it works. Next to him, a printer is printing sheet after sheet of paper, and all the while, the man screams. The officer recognizes the man's face from one of the files. This is one of the missing employees. He can't determine what is causing the man such distress, and he tries to ask the man what happened to him. The man just continues to scream, eyes wide open and wild, rolling around in their sockets, unfocused and unseeing. The officer grabs the man, attempting to remove him from the wall, but he won't budge. It's as if his body is wired into the wall itself, and the harder the officer tugs, the more it appears as if the man's flesh will begin to tear away. The officer stops, turning his attention to the machinery. Perhaps if he unplugs it, he'll be able to remove the man more easily. He starts with the printer, and as he reaches for its plug, he gets a closer look at the paper it continues to spit out. It doesn't look like any paper he's ever seen, and unable to help himself, he reaches out to touch it. It's warm, soft, pliable, and nauseatingly familiar. It isn't paper at all. It's skin. In that moment, all of the officer's training falls out of his mind, replaced with blind terror. He runs from the building as fast as he can, all the way back to the police station, where he tearfully informs his captain about what he found. This is no longer a police matter, his captain tells him. They need to escalate this to a specialized organization. The young officer is sent home, placed on psychiatric leave, and the next day, the SCP Foundation investigates the building it will come to refer to as SCP-2535. SCP-2535 is a former two-story Hewlett-Packard branch office building in the Zhaoshan district of Hangzhou, China. The building's anomalous nature is characterized by the presence of a detailed network of electrical and biological components of unknown origins. The walls of the building's entire first story are covered with 63,512 USB 2.0 standard A sockets, placed in a grid pattern made up of 20-centimeter semi-regular intervals. Each of these sockets is connected to wires running through the walls, but these are no ordinary wires. They consist of a woven mixture of copper strands and human optic nerve tissue, all wrapped in a layer of keratin. In spite of the inclusion of organic material in their structure, the wires have not shown any signs of decay or deterioration since the Foundation discovered SCP-2535. This curious, off-putting mix of the technological and the biological persists throughout the location and only gets stranger as one moves deeper into the building. If one were to follow the path of these wires, going against their better judgment and the scream of their most primal instincts, they would find that the wires lead to a room on the building's second floor. The room is currently inaccessible, but is thought to have once been the server room. Whatever is blocking the door is large enough that it cannot be budged, and non-intrusive imaging has determined that it is some sort of biological mass. The inside of the former server room, like the wires that lead there, emits heat at a consistent temperature of 47.6 degrees Celsius. Foundation personnel who approached the room have reported a persistent smell of sulfur and ozone coming from inside, as well as the loud sound of a running printer. 317 of the USB socket and power outlets in SCP-2535 are connected to HP brand USB 2.0 compatible devices. Of these devices, 20 have displayed anomalous, potentially ectoentropic functions. But what exactly does that mean? Allow me to elaborate. Just remember, you asked for this. Don't blame me if you aren't able to stomach the details. There are five former employees of the Hewlett-Packard Hangzhou branch still located inside of SCP-2535. These employees are in an anomalous sort of status, requiring no sleep, food, or water in spite of their continued, seemingly endless consciousness. Since the building's discovery in April of 2013, they have not changed in any way, or at least not in any visible way. All attempts to remove these former employees from their 
let's call them predicaments, have proven unsuccessful. Allow me to discard any euphemism and explain just what exactly became of these unfortunate workers. First, there is Guo Pingping, the former branch manager. He can be found in the bathroom near the receptionist's desk on the first floor. Goa's head has been forced into the feed tray of a DP DeskJet 1112 printer, which is plugged into the wall. This is troubling for a number of reasons, one of which is that the internal dimensions of this particular DeskJet model's feed tray are not large enough to accommodate a human head, and its components are not strong enough to crush a human skull into a shape that would fit. Nonetheless, Goa's head is firmly lodged into the feed tray. One would assume this would have killed him, but his body continues to move, kicking and thrashing about as if he is in pain. The former assistant branch manager, James Gu Yonggun, is located in the employee pantry on the building's second floor. His body is attached to the wall in a vertical position, held there via 92 20-inch USB 2.0 M-M cables. Five additional cables have been used to secure the actuating unit of an HP DeskJet 2540 all-in-one printer to Gu's lower jaw. The arm of the actuating unit is also attached to a single HP-10 original ink cartridge in the color black. This ink cartridge is attached into Gu's throat at a continuous rate of one stroke per second and, in defiance of the known properties of ordinary ink cartridges, has yet to run out of ink in the years since its discovery. Gu appears to be partially conscious, but is unable to communicate intelligibly when addressed. The former Human Resources Department head, Angel Li Huimin, is still in her former office on the second floor though she no longer performs the duties of her old position. She is still, in a sense, in human resources, or rather, is a human resource. I apologize, sometimes I have to make a joke to cope with the dark subject matter at hand, but Angel's fate is no laughing matter. Like Goo, she is attached to the wall via a series of USB cables. There is an additional cable, one of unspecified length, inserted into her lower abdomen, which is slightly distended, as though filled with a foreign object. Though a proper analysis has not yet been conducted, the variety of sounds and motions originating from the area seem to indicate that there is a fully operational HP USB single station thermal receipt printer lodged near her small intestine. As a consequence of this, a never ending stream of thermal receipt paper is pouring from Angel's mouth at all times, causing her considerable pain and distress. Wang Liang, the former head of the IT department, is permanently placed near the water cooler on the first floor. Like the others, he's bound to the wall by several USB cables, 37 to be exact. There are 12 HP ScanJet 200 scanners pressed against his body, all switched on and running at all times. Next to him, an HP DeskJet 1112 printer is attached to the wall and constantly printing out sheets of… something. A closer inspection reveals that it is not paper, but rather, sheets of skin. He is conscious, but no successful interview with Wang has been conducted due to his nearly constant, wordless screams of agony. The fifth human subject found in SCP-2535 is Chen Yupeng, who once worked as a trainee technical writer. Now he spends his days in the branch manager's office on the second floor of the building. His body has been wedged into the paper tray and backup paper tray of an HP LaserJet Pro 500 multifunction printer, which has been plugged into the wall via a standard power cable and a 3 feet USB 2.0 M-M cable. His head sticks out of an aperture, cut into the side of the printer. The printer itself functions normally, printing copies of the HP standard print quality diagnostic page and the HP LaserJet 500 technical repair manual, alternating between the two. Since SCP-2535's discovery, it has not run out of either paper or ink. Chen himself is unconscious and shows signs of severe blood loss that, under ordinary circumstances, likely would have resulted in death by now. During a preliminary inspection of the building, one Foundation operative discovered a Canon PIXMA E480 printer in the first floor janitor's closet. This printer was dented and heavily corroded, most likely from the application of liquid bleach, and was also covered with human teeth marks. It has spent the most recent several years attempting to print a 91-page document, but has been unsuccessful due to an apparent jam in its paper tray and feed mechanism. The seams of the printer occasionally ooze human blood, which DNA testing has matched to Yan Xiaoxia, former creative consultant of the Hangzhou branch. SCP-2535 must be sealed away from the public under the guise of health and safety concerns. At least two agents are to be stationed in a nearby building at all times for the purposes of observation. Wherever possible, the inside of SCP-2535 must be soundproofed. All material generated by the building's anomalies must be collected and disposed of on a daily basis. 
So far, these containment measures have been sufficient to keep civilians away from SCP-2535. As far as the friends and family of the missing employees know, their loved ones were never found. It's better that they think of them as lost or dead, rather than learn what truly became of them. As I was poring over the file for SCP-2535, something curious caught my attention. This is not the only anomaly catalogued by the SCP Foundation concerning a branch of the Hewlett Packard Corporation. I considered leaving well enough alone, but I've never been particularly good at that. When another path presents itself to me, no matter how dark or foreboding it may seem, I cannot resist the urge to see where it will lead. In this case, the path led me to SCP-2211. SCP-2211 was a collection of four anomalies discovered in the Shanghai offices of Hewlett Packard. Notice that I said, was, rather than is. More on that later. First, allow me to describe the nature of each anomaly. SCP-2211-1 is a 932MB video file titled simply longsmile.wmv. When played, the video depicts a pair of lips on the right edge of the screen. The lips hold a closed mouth smile for a moment, then open to reveal teeth. At this point in the video, the camera pans to the right, revealing more and more teeth, seemingly forever. Though the length of the video file is listed as 55 seconds, testing revealed that the file will continue to play, revealing endless, maddening rows of teeth for more than 150 straight hours. It will possibly run even longer than that, but testing was through before that could be seen. The video has no audio track. When longsmile.wmv is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device used to play it will begin to secrete a small amount of human saliva. A sample of saliva was collected for DNA testing, but the results were inconclusive and did not match any known human being on record. SCP-2211-2 is a 2.0 megabyte audio file entitled EYEE-79.WAV. Each playthrough of the audio file is different, but tends to contain bursts of modulated static that go on for 2 to 10 seconds before being cut off for around 0.3 seconds of silence at a time. Like Long Smile, this file can play for a seemingly infinite amount of time, in spite of its listed length of 3 minutes and 3 seconds. When SCP-2211-2 is played for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, the device will begin to secrete a clear fluid, identified as a mixture of water and sodium chloride, amino acids, glutathione, ascorbic acid, and human collagen fibers. Essentially, the device will begin to leak human tears. SCP-2211-3 is a 599 kilobyte file titled r.exe. When this file is run on a computer, it uses up a great deal of memory, causing the device to overheat and its built-in fans to speed up. In spite of the overheating and any damage it might cause, the computer will continue to run until disconnected from its power source. When the file is run for longer than 59 minutes and 20 seconds, air coming through the built-in fans will begin to emit a strong smell of earwax. Though no physical traces of earwax have been found, SCP-2211-4 is a USB adapter-powered coffee reheater. When it is plugged into the USB port of a computer, any liquid placed into the container will be heated to approximately 65 degrees Celsius and will also transform into human mucus at a rate of 1 milliliter per minute. This effect is the same whether or not the computer is on. DNA analysis of the mucus revealed that it is a match with the saliva produced by SCP-2211-1. All of this would have been bizarre enough, a series of files and devices that produce human biological material and are seemingly all connected, but something else happened. All instances of SCP-2211 were kept in a pair of containment lockers. However, on June 10, 2014, this containment was breached. I have included a surveillance log transcript that captured the incident. It occurred as follows. Sound of banging metal detected near second floor of Wing B. Door of small item containment locker DAD-2838 is heavily deformed outwards and has experienced a heavy impact from its inside. The sound of banging metal persists for the next three minutes as the door of containment locker DAD-2838 begins to burst outwards. Security teams are deployed to cordon off the area and manage the situation. Containment locker DAD-2838 is fully breached from the inside when a segmented, humanoid arm emerges, extending to reveal numerous joints along its length. Security teams begin opening fire on the arm to little effect. While the video feed shows that the arm terminates in a seven-fingered hand, personnel present on the scene reported a number of fingers ranging from five to approximately 30. 
The arm repeatedly strikes and breaches the containment locker containing SCP-2211-4, approximately 5 meters from containment locker DAD-2838. It subsequently reaches for SCP-2211-4 and pulls it back into containment locker DAD-2838. No further activity detected. Arm presumed to have dematerialized. Following this incident, the containment locker was examined, but no traces of the many-fingered arm were found inside. Further examination of the locker's contents revealed that SCP-2211-1, 2, and 3 had vanished from their storage media. The files were gone. SCP-2211-4, when tested, no longer displayed any anomalous properties. It was just an ordinary coffee heater, though no staff wanted to use it to heat their coffee, no matter how many times it was washed. Head researcher Min declared SCP-2211 uncontained on August 10, 2014. But there was one more unusual finding. The USB drive that once contained SCP-2211-1 was not empty. There was an untitled text file on the drive. When opened, it simply read, Got my my nose, followed by an unusual text emoticon, colon colon o o, end parentheses, end parentheses. As a man of science, one who has devoted my life to exploring the unexplained and seeking answers to questions that most are afraid to even ask, nothing troubles me quite like a mystery left unsolved. But the tales of these Chinese Hewlett Packard offices are composed almost entirely of disturbing mysteries, of frayed wires and broken printers, of survivors that cannot tell their stories, and messages we will never get to read. What happened after that Hangzhou branch closed? Was it connected to the findings at the Shanghai branch? Did that mysterious arm grab hold of the Hangzhou team, contorting their bodies into unrecognizable shapes and forcing them to meld with the products they once sold? Or was it once an employee too, broken down into spare parts and trapped as files and desktop beverage warmers? I can't be certain. But I do know this. I'm throwing out my printer. I think I'll just write my notes by hand from now on. I won't necessarily suggest you do the same, but do be careful while handling the machinery. Treat it with respect. After all, you never know if that printer was once as human as you or me. A bear mauling you to death being stalked by cougars in the dead of night, only to be eaten in your sleep. Wandering off the path and getting lost for days, the elements slowly withering you away to nothingness. There are plenty of ways you can die in the wilderness, but few would expect death to come as a result of a simple bodily function with a decidedly anomalous twist. Springtime in the Sierra Nevada is undeniably beautiful. The unpredictable storms of winter are a thing of the past, but the oppressive heat of summer hasn't yet crept in. The highest peaks of the mountains are still spotted with snow, but in the foothills, the wildflowers sprout from the earth, blooming in a tapestry of yellow, pink, purple, and orange. Crystal clear waterfalls roar down the rocky mountainsides, water set free from its slumber by the melting ice as the world wakes up from a long hibernation. The summer vacation crowds haven't yet flooded the hiking trails and ski slopes, but a few groups of early adventurers can be spotted hiking through the mountains, taking in the sights, and breathing in the fresh, fragrant air. Among these springtime visitors are a pair of young men, one with blonde hair and one with dark hair, each wearing a small backpack and carrying a canteen of water, not a scuff to be seen on their brand new hiking boots. These two young men are on their senior spring break from college, gleefully taking the hiking trip they have been talking about since they were paired up as roommates their freshman year. Neither of these young men is especially experienced in hiking, but they have both spent dozens of hours in the library reading up on wilderness survival, on the best ways to pitch a tent and start a fire with nothing more than a stick and two rocks. The lighter-haired of the two especially prides himself on his knowledge of foraging for edible wild plants, a skill he is excited to put to the test on this trip. His dark-haired companion is a bit more suspicious of wild plants, frightened by the stories of foraging gone wrong and unfortunate explorers confusing a delicious mushroom for one that stops the heart in minutes. He has filled his bag with provisions, with granola and jerky, dried fruits, and cans of beans that he hopes his friend will share with him, rather than risking his safety by gambling on a wild root or berry. Still, his concerns about foraging are soon forgotten as the two proceed further along the trail, passing sparkling waterfalls, bighorn sheep grazing on wild plants, and a bird that just might be a bald eagle soaring by overhead. The two are lost in the majesty of nature, so lost, in fact, that they forget to eat until the sun is dipping over the horizon and the world is growing dark around them. Out here in the mountains, with no light pollution to speak of, 
Dark is dark. Even with the help of the lanterns they brought, the two men can scarcely see well enough to put up their tents and build a small fire. Still, they remember all of their reading, and manage to set up a modest camp for the night. The dark-haired man pulls a bag of beans from his backpack and begins to heat them over the flame. He offers some to his companion, but he refuses. The blonde man has found a shrub that he recognizes, weighed down with ripe fruit. This shrub, he explains to his friend, is a species of manzanita, an evergreen shrub that produces berries similar in flavor to little apples. The dark-haired man is dubious. Aren't manzanita berries typically red in color? These appear to be a shade of brown. Wait! The young man reaches out and stops his friend just before he can pop the berries into his mouth. At least let me look them up on my phone. That won't work out here, his friend tells him. The government blocks access to the web out here. They don't want you on the internet. It's a big conspiracy. Everyone knows about it. Page unavailable. His friend is right. But wait, he has the ultimate tool to defeat this intrusion on his lunch lookup liberties because he has Surfshark VPN. Surfshark, the sponsor of today's video. The virtual private network that keeps your online identity safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet. With the simple press of a button, he's able to change his location to somewhere well outside the Sierra Nevadas and access the blocked content thanks to over 3,200 servers Surfshark has around the world in 100 countries that allow you to bypass censorship and geo restrictions no matter where you are. And you don't need to worry about who might be watching you since Surfshark masks your IP address to make sure that your city, country, and download history aren't linked back to your identity. It's the absolute best way to stay safe online and keep your personal information secure from whoever might want to use it for their nefarious deeds. So why not try it out for yourself? Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. Dr. Bob viewers who use my code Dr. Bob get an extra three months free. So use the link in the description and check it out for yourself. You'll be glad you did. The wannabe forager insists that he has correctly identified the plant and that these berries will be his dinner. The dark-haired man shrugs and treats himself to a meal of beans and dried apples, while his friend munches on handfuls of the brown berries. He has no complaints about the taste and does not immediately drop dead upon eating them, so perhaps he was right, and these are manzanitas after all. As soon as the thought crosses the dark-haired man's mind, he sees his friend double over, clutching at his stomach in discomfort. Afraid for his friend's safety, he rushes to his side, only to be met with a long, loud fart. The two share a laugh, the tension broken by the sudden smelly outburst, but the humor soon fades as the blonde man farts again, and again, and again. All through the night, he continues to emit loud, excruciatingly smelly farts. The smell permeates the campsite, seeping into the dark-haired man's tent no matter how he tries to cover his nose with his sleeping bag. He doesn't get a wink of sleep, spending the night wide awake, staring at the ceiling of his tent, and silently wishing for the relentless stream of gas to stop but it doesn't. It just carries on until the dark-haired man can scarcely remember a time when he wasn't listening to the maddening sound. Again and again and again, the endless farts. He clenches his fists until the knuckles turn white, clenches his jaw, and grinds his teeth. It's enough to drive a man insane. The next morning, it is still happening. The blonde man expresses embarrassment, but does not apologize for ignoring his friend's warnings about the berries. He tries to laugh it off, but the dark-haired man does not join him in his laughter. If he had only listened, they wouldn't be in this situation. They wouldn't be about to continue their hike with this rancid, gaseous albatross around their necks. As they pack up camp, the dark-haired man glances down at the tent pole in his hand. One good swing, and he could put a stop to the madness. No, that's ridiculous. He shakes his head, clearing the impulse from his mind. The gastrointestinal distress will pass soon, and they will be able to continue the trip like they planned. But it doesn't pass. Nothing passes, but the gas itself. The blonde man asks if they can stop for water before they've even been hiking for an hour. He isn't feeling very well, he explains. He woke up dizzy and nauseated, disoriented from lying there all night, breathing in the fumes. The dark-haired man wants to say something to retort that he too was suffering all night, but he doesn't. He just lets his friend stop to drink some water and they proceed with the hike. Gone is the magic of the previous day, the time before the cursed berries. The men can no longer smell the wildflowers, the crisp mountain air. There are no wild animals to be found, not a single ground squirrel or little bird. Up ahead on the trail, the dark-haired man catches the barest glimpse of a tail vanishing into the brush as a mountain lion runs the other way. Is it fleeing from them? From the stench? He wouldn't blame the beast if it was. They have five more days of this planned, 
and he can feel his resolve beginning to fade. Maybe he can turn back, ask to cut the trip short now, but why should he have to suffer just because his friend made a mistake identifying a wild berry? It isn't fair. If he could just get a moment to think without the incessant farting, if he could just have one second of peace, maybe he could come up with a solution. But no respite comes. If anything, it only seems to get worse. The smell burns his nostrils, the sound rings in his ears. The blonde man tries to speak over it, to clear the air with pleasant conversation, but the dark-haired man brushes him off with grunts and shrugs. His eyes sting and water, he chokes on the stench. He knows in his heart that he can't take much more of this. When the men make camp for the night again, the dark-haired man's thoughts turn dark. He could just leave in the dead of night while his friend is sleeping, rush off into the wilderness and abandon his companion there, freeing himself from the farts. He tries to justify it to himself. They both have the survival skills to make it. He'll be fine. His thoughts of leaving his friend alone in the woods are interrupted by the sound of chewing. Is there any animal nearby? No, surely no animal would approach given the smell. He takes a look in the blonde man's tent and finds his friend eating another handful of those same brown berries. The dark-haired man flies into a rage, unable to contain his fury. How could he do this? How could he eat more of them after what happened the first time? Doesn't he understand what this is doing to him, what it's doing to the both of them? How could he be so selfish? The blonde man insists that it's fine, that the farting can't possibly be related to the berries, because manzanitas don't cause that sort of thing. At this, something in the dark-haired man snaps. He can't take it anymore. He turns away from the tent, throwing up his hands and telling the blonde man to find his own way back. They'll split up from here. The blonde man emerges from his tent, begging his friend not to cast him out. He's certain the farting will stop any day now. At this, it seems to grow louder and more potent. The dark-haired man spots a large rock by the campfire, small enough to hold in his hand, hefty enough to do some real damage. He picks it up and turns to meet his friend. Without thinking, he swings the rock at the blonde man's head. For the first time in days, the sound of farts goes silent. The air smells sweet, like flowers, leaves, and campfire smoke. He did what he had to do. The dark-haired man lets out a sigh of relief, the rock falling from his hand. He glances at the rock on the ground, at the blood dripping down its surface, and realizes the full weight of what he has just done. He packs up the campsite as quickly as he can, douses the fire, and dumps the body over the edge of a nearby cliff. Over the next few days, he hikes back the way he and his friend came, noticing in spite of his gnawing guilt that the walk really is so much better without those damned farts. On the way, he passes that bush, that horrible bush, weighed down by the fruit that destroyed his spring break trip, that destroyed his friend's life. He opens his backpack, tearing a page from one of his books and grabbing a pen. He scribbles a warning, no matter what, do not eat these berries, and affixes it to the bush. He can only hope that the next person to stumble on this shrub will see the note and heed its warning. If they don't, they might meet a similar fate. Days later, the park rangers discover the blonde man's body and declare the death an accident caused when the man fell over the side of the cliff. Some of them suspect foul play, but are unable to find any evidence. All they can find is a strange note on an unidentified shrub and the faintest smell of something foul, like rotten eggs. The two doomed hikers had no way of knowing this, but the fruit they foraged was not from the Manzanita family. It was from a plant known as SCP-4032. SCP-4032 is a wide, deciduous shrub characterized by a rounded crown and wider base. It produces a distinct, small, round brown fruit that has been designated SCP-4032-1. Whenever any animal or human consumes an instance of SCP-4032-1, this meal will result in intense gastrointestinal distress. I will try to describe this as delicately as I possibly can, but as I have learned over the years in my line of work, the truth is rarely delicate or polite. One hour following the consumption of an SCP-4032-1 instance, the person or animal will begin to emit an excessive amount of flatulence, consisting of elevated hydrogen sulfide levels and a small but detectable amount of methane gas. Perhaps you are familiar with an old rhyming song about the wonders of beans, the magical fruit. These berries function quite similarly. The more one eats, the more one does, in fact, for want of a better word, toot. However, unlike the second part of the bean-based rhyme, these fruits do not cause their unfortunate consumers to feel better, nor should they be eaten at every or any meal.
The Foundation first discovered SCP-4032 on April 2, 2018, after a man named Anthony Green happened upon the plant in the foothills of Northern California. Hungry enough to forget his better judgment, Anthony ate some of the fruit and became immediately concerned for his physical well-being as SCP-4032's effects began to take hold. Fearing he had unknowingly consumed a poisonous plant, he made a distress call to the local search and rescue team. This call was intercepted by Foundation operatives, who swiftly arrived at the scene to bring both Anthony and the plant itself into custody. The affected individual will continue to produce this flatulence until they have expired. Both starvation and dehydration have no impact on the flatulence, and no identifiable source of the gaseous output has been detected via endoscopy. If an affected individual finds themselves in an area without adequate ventilation, they will gradually begin to experience symptoms brought on by hydrogen sulfide poisoning, including but not limited to conjunctivitis, respiratory irritation and coughing, loss of smell, and eventually pulmonary edema and death. Shortly following SCP-4032's discovery, Dr. Logari began conducting a thorough observation of Anthony Green, referred to as D-14478 for the purposes of official documentation, as he suffered from the effects of consuming SCP-4032-1. First, he was brought in for observation and placed in cell 14B on the outside of Site 88. Dr. Logari noted copious amounts of flatulence being emitted by the subject with high levels of hydrogen sulfide and methane. Five hours later, the subject was complaining about gas buildup in his cell, and the interior venting hood was activated. Three hours and over 50 complaints later, the maintenance staff deactivated the interior venting hood and opened exterior windows. In an attempt to quell some of the relentless flatulence, D-14478 was placed on an intravenous diet. After two days on the intravenous diet and no changes to the subject's gas emissions, medical staff conducted an endoscopy, which revealed that the colon was clear and there were no visible signs of rectal gas. The following day, a staff meeting was held in order to discuss the impact of D-14478's condition on the quality of life at the facility. Both residents and researchers alike had complained about the persistent smell, which they were unable to escape, and was permeating the air outside as well as throughout the interior of the building. Several options were proposed, including relocation, treatment, and failing all else, termination of the subject. A resolution was passed to house D-14478 in an outdoor facility until proper filtering equipment could be installed. A little over a week later, Foundation agents intercepted reports from nearby environmental watch groups concerning an increase in airborne pollution in the central Alabama area around Site-88. With D-14478's condition threatening not only the morale at Site-88, but the environment itself, an additional resolution was passed in order to transfer D-14478 into an experimental air filtering cell. The cell had not yet passed a safety inspection, but those with objections were overruled by the vote of the majority. The following day, subject D-14478 was found dead in his cell. An investigation into the cause of death determined that the primary filter was improperly constructed, and both it and its associated sensor had malfunctioned. There was one silver lining to this unfortunate incident, however. The effects of SCP-4032-1 mercifully ceased following the subject's death. The post-mortem report was filed with the Ethics Committee, and Dr. Logari was placed on temporary administrative leave. Meanwhile, a large order of scented candles was placed by the staff of Site-88, and soon, the unpleasant odor was replaced with the smells of lavender, vanilla, sugar, and pine. In Dr. Logari's absence, Dr. Carlisle was appointed to the position of lead researcher on SCP-4032. Following the approval of the Ethics Committee, Dr. Carlisle began conducting a series of animal tests using SCP-4032. The first test subject selected was the Araucanian herring. An instance of SCP-4032-1 was crushed and added to a mix of coat pods and krill, which were then fed to a small school of herring. Fifteen minutes after the consumption of SCP-4032-1, the herring's usual flattest production increased dramatically. This caused great distress to the school of fish, as this species ordinarily uses flatulence as a means of communication. Samples of the flattest were taken and analyzed, and were found to contain hydrogen sulfide and methane, though the levels of both were lower than they had been in human subjects. Three hours after their initial feeding, the herring were euthanized and taken for autopsy and chemical analysis. There was no post-mortem evidence found of SCP-4032-1's effects. Next, a flock of chickens was selected for testing. They were offered a handful of SCP-4032-1 directly, which they refused to taste. 
The fruit was then crushed and added to chicken feed, which was fed to the chickens with great success. Two hours after eating SCP-4032-1, all of the chickens began to emit gas containing low levels of methane and hydrogen sulfide. The chickens were promptly euthanized and taken for analysis, where an autopsy determined that the bird's short intestinal tracts were distended. This marked the first recorded visible sign of the fruit's impact on a test subject. The next animals selected for testing were brown-throated three-toed sloths. This particular species was chosen due to its lack of flatulence, as these sloths tend to absorb flatus and release it through their lungs, rather than rectally. The fruit was offered directly at first, but the sloths rejected it. The fruit was then crushed and ground with a mixture of tree leaves and fed to the sloths. Whatever happened next has been redacted from the official Foundation file, but it was disturbing enough to bring a grinding halt to any and all future testing of SCP-4032 on large mammals. Any potential animal experiments involving SCP-4032 must be approved by the Ethics Committee in order to prevent another, quote, sloth incident. SCP-4032 has been contained in a cordoned-off portion of the research gardens at Site-67, which consists of the area around SCP-4032's original location. This land was purchased by the Foundation, and a research facility disguised as a personal estate was constructed there. SCP-4032, along with several other anomalous plants, is kept in the garden portion of the site. All instances of SCP-4032-1 are to be gathered from the ground on a daily basis and incinerated on site. Any employees found to be using the berries for unapproved personal purposes will be suspended or terminated from their positions. If any animals wander onto the grounds and consume the berries, they must be captured and euthanized, and their bodies incinerated. Though there is currently only one known specimen of SCP-4032, the Foundation has a contingency plan in place should any additional specimens be discovered. If this happens, Mobile Task Force Alpha-67 Weed Whackers will be dispatched to the specimen's location, where they will uproot it and bring it back to Site-67 to be contained. Any humans that consume an instance of SCP-4032-1 must be contained in holding cells B1 through B5 along the outer perimeter of Site-67. Each of these cells is equipped with three air filters containing Thiobacillus thioparis, chemolithoatrophic sulfur oxidizing bacteria embedded in a mixture of peat and polyurethane. Each filter also contains sensors intended to detect hydrogen sulfide and methane. When the sensors are activated, members of Mobile Task Force Alpha-13 odor eaters are dispatched to escort the affected individual outside until the filters in their cell can be repaired. Currently, the Foundation does not believe there to be any additional specimens of SCP-4032 in the wild. However, there is no way to be certain of this, due to the plant's relatively unassuming appearance and the lack of any information on its origins. It is entirely possible that there are more of these shrubs just waiting to be discovered by an unfortunate hiker wandering off the beaten path. So if you find yourself out in nature with an empty stomach, make sure that you have accurately identified any of the wild plants you consume. If you don't, you may be met with a fate that is silent but deadly. Seeing that shadowy figure coming towards him makes the worker turn and run. He hasn't had the time nor the luxury of freezing on the spot or waiting for it to get closer so he could get a clearer view. He just runs. With every pace, every hurried, horrified step, comes the mental image of the strange figure gaining on him. In his head, every movement he catches in the corner of his eye, every shuffling sound he detects, the thing was right behind him, inches away and ready to strike. So he just keeps on running. Only seconds ago, it was just standing under a streetlight, a ways ahead of the worker, barely moving. He calls out to it, assuming it's a person, somebody may be lost or in need of help. But then, it steps into the light, and it's not a person at all. The head of the suit isn't on properly, it droops at an angle like it hasn't been affixed or is barely hanging on. The crude, lazy-eyed face is haphazardly drooping. That too isn't on right, as the entire head sways unnervingly with each approaching step. Maybe underneath the suit, hiding beneath all that dirty orange fur, still coated in grime despite the rain, Perhaps there's a person in there, whose arm hefts an old baseball bat as they plod closer and closer to the worker. But all he sees is the monster. The filthy costume might be clumsily made, but the worker instantly recognizes the all-too-familiar resemblance of an orange cat from a popular comic strip. It's what starts him running. That and the blunt weapon the monster is holding as it menacingly makes its way closer. The downpour doesn't let up as the worker turns a corner, met with the sights of two bright, blinding white beams of light cutting through the rain. 
a car speeding its way down the road. It catches the worker in its headlights, and he starts frantically waving his arms, encased in the sodden fabric of his jacket. Help! Oh, please! Please help me! He yells. Something's coming after me! I think it's trying to kill me! The driver doesn't stop. Instead, simply cruising past, the worker can just about see through the passenger side window, the vehicle's sole occupant giving him a strange look from inside the safety of his car. Almost as quickly as it appears, the car has driven off, its headlights already fading from view thanks to the rain. What the worker doesn't realize is that the driver's look of confusion wasn't directed at him, but at the thing following him. The creature gives a low, animalistic sound, which causes the worker to spin around. Now he sees it, right up close in all its foul, ginger glory. A tail dangles lazily from the lower portion of the suit, trailing in puddles laden with muck, the water making the fur even dirtier than it already is. It's so close that the awful, pungent stench of the thing hits the worker's nostrils, a sickening smell that somehow seems to fit with the grim, gross costume and its wearer. Seeing the wet, fur-coated suit so close, he realizes that it isn't covered in the soft, plush, synthetic coat that he expects a costume like that to be made of. It looks real, like actual cat hair on a huge humanoid shape with the legs and arms of a man, arms that were midway through swinging a baseball bat right at the worker's head. He ducks just in time, the dull wooden bat glancing off the bricks of a nearby building, narrowly missing the worker's head. As it bounces off the wall, the blunt weapon slips from the soggy gloves of the suit and clatters to the ground. The second he hears the wooden bat land on the ground, the worker turns his heel and runs again, taking advantage of those precious few seconds to get further distance between him and his attacker. It's only exactly as he turns his back that he wishes he'd reached for the bat himself to fight back. Rushing further down the rain-swept street, the worker can hear the heavy slumping footsteps of the suited attacker giving chase. He alternates between looking straight ahead, the raindrops streaming down his face and getting into his eyes, and daring to glance back over his shoulder. Every time he does, he's met again with the horrifying sight of the suit behind him. He wants nothing more than to escape, to get out of this nightmare wherein he is soaked head to toe in rainwater and fear, running for his life, from someone dressed as the comic strip cat he sees every day. But as strong as his will to escape is, he can't bear to let the first suited pursuer out of his sight for even a second. If he can't see it, then it might be anywhere. At least looking told him that he was still right behind him, bearing down on the worker with its bat now firmly back in hand. The shrill noise of chain links rattling sounds behind him, as the attacker in the suit starts striking a nearby fence, making the worker more and more aware that, with every strike, it's getting closer. Through the relentless downpour, the worker spots a shape standing on the sidewalk just a few feet ahead. Short, stationary, something he sees every day of his life but never pays any notice to. But tonight, it might just be the thing that saves his life. A trash can. It's full, and that means heavy, and any second now, he'll be close enough to reach it. A plan forms in seconds, erupting like a fire with gasoline thrown on it. If that gasoline was pure, terrified adrenaline of being chased by someone in an orange cat costume, Reaching out, as soon as his fingertips grip the wet metal rim of the can, the worker pulls as hard as possible, his instincts keeping him from stopping running. The trash can clatters behind him as he passes, followed by the heavy thud of the attacker falling to the ground as it trips over the obstacle and lands furry head first in the garbage now strewn over the sidewalk. The worker knows he's only got another short window, another blessing of a precious few seconds to get far enough away from his attacker. He turns, changing course to rush across the street. There's an old warehouse over there. If there are security guards working, they might be able to help. If not, and the place is unguarded, then at least it could be somewhere to hide. A sudden blaring noise pierces the worker's eardrums before he can make it all the way to the opposite sidewalk. It's a horn, coupled with a bright pair of lights appearing as if from nowhere. Then, before he can turn to see it coming, impact. First against the hood of the car, speeding through the rain towards him, unable to stop in enough time. Next, the pain of hitting the jagged blacktop of the road. The second impact, as the worker lands a few feet away, spots of rain still pattering against his face as everything goes from dark to pitch black for a few seconds. His head floods with scenes from earlier that day, as if his life was about to start flashing before his eyes, only in reverse. The news of the comic strip doing poorly arrives at the Paws Inc. office, and with it, the knowledge that, if there are going to be layoffs, then he'll be first. He's the new hire, after all. It didn't matter that the once beloved comic of a cartoon cat is losing its popularity, going stale after so many years in print. It upset the investors, and the worker has been worrying all day if he'd be the one fired to appease them, until he suddenly remembers what's coming after him. 
fighting back and clawing his way back to consciousness, he struggles back to his feet, screaming with pain. He's injured, that much he can certainly tell, even if he doesn't know how badly. Hey, hey mister! The driver calls, stopping his car and starting to climb out of the vehicle. It's a different driver in car this time, and unlike the first, he makes the effort to stop, a mistake that is about to cost him greatly. He sees the worker getting back up, ignoring his calls. He raises his voice to cut through the noise of the pouring rain. Hey, you okay? I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. My lights were on low, wipers are going, it wasn't until you rushed out across the street that… Anyway, look, let me at least get you to a hospital. We can exchange our insurance information once they get you all patched up. The worker wasn't listening. He hears the driver's words but pays him no mind. He's still so intent on getting away that it takes him a second to realize. The car. It's a way out. And then, the worker makes the same mistake as the driver. He stops. And when he does, he sees what has clambered back to its fur-coated feet and is now shuffling towards the driver. Look out! The worker yells. The driver turns, just in time to see. What the hell? He exclaims. Wait a minute, why are you dressed in a Garfield costume? Whack! The sound of the bat being swung at the driver makes the worker feel sick. He turns his back and moves as quickly as he can towards the warehouse, despite the pain and the horrified screams coming from behind. Beneath the rain, there's something else. A twisted, vile squelching noise that quickly snuffs out the driver's dying cries. The worker doesn't dare to look back this time. He doesn't want to see what's happening. Lifting a heavy metal shutter and pulling it shut behind him, he finds himself in the warehouse. It's completely deserted. There isn't a single sign of life anywhere. The only sound is the pattering of rainwater against the hard concrete floor, dripping through a hole in the ceiling. Guided by the low, glowing light of the street lamps outside that bleeds through the warehouse windows, the worker starts fumbling around for a place to hide. Just as he crawls underneath a large pallet rack, he hears a metallic rattling as the fur-suited monstrosity lifts up the shutter. It's inside. With heavy, plodding steps in its suit, it paces up and down the aisles of discarded shelving. The worker clamps his soaked hands against his mouth, trying to mask his panicked breathing, only to let out a scream as he feels something grab his ankle and pull. With ease, the thing dressed as a disheveled Garfield pulls him out of his hiding place. Instinctively, the worker thrashes his legs, landing a solid kick to the creature. As his foot connects, he notices it doesn't feel like a person underneath the suit. There's no body, no familiar outline of a human being beneath all the soggy fur and stench. It's just a slimy mass. Nonetheless, the kick knocks the garish Garfield back, only a few paces, but better than nothing. He scrabbles to his feet, standing and running as fast as he can in the opposite direction, only to hit a wall at the far side of the warehouse. The shutter is the only way out, and right now it's wide open. But Garfield stands between the worker and freedom. He turns to dart down the next aisle, between the rows of shelves, keeping his eyes on the attacker as he passes underneath the hole in the ceiling. The rain is still coming down through it, leaving a puddle on the floor. The worker's focus is locked on the beast. He suddenly feels his foot slipping out from under him, that awful lurch of his heart as he falls. The puddle. He slipped on it and come crashing down to the ground. The force of the concrete striking his back knocks all the breath from his lungs. Everything is spinning in a nauseating mix of pain, disorientation, and terror. Above, through the unrepaired ceiling, drops of rain come pouring down on him. Then, a low, agonized meow from somewhere nearby. The monster, Garfield, brings its bat swinging down and sharply connecting with the worker lying on the ground. A new surge of pain racks his body, right at the hip where the baseball bat just landed in an unforgiving blow. The worker can do nothing but scream in pain and fear. A horrible sound, like something wet tearing, fills his ears over his own cries. He remembers the sickening feeling of a slimy mass being aggressively pushed into his face. It's disgusting, rancid, but even under all the horror and the repulsive taste, he can detect familiar hints. Pasta, beef, tomato sauce, cheese, all of it moldy and rotten but still recognizable. The monstrous SCP-3166 forces further fistfuls of lasagna down the worker's throat until the screaming stops. He'd always hated Mondays. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, The Exposition Gun Makes Nintendo Real Life.